Hello, and welcome back to True Crime Guys Podcast. I'm Lauren. And I'm Michael. First day of fall. Super Is cool. Is it the first day of fall? It's like cold out, actually, in Vegas today. I, I, I mean, really cold for cold for Vegas, not cold if you're like in Wisconsin right outside. now. And if you're in Wisconsin and you're here, you're probably Wisconsin. wearing a Speedo going, <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so hot outside. <laughs> I need to get some more sunblock. Right. <laughs> No, it feels amazing out though. It's like sunny, like seventy degrees. Yep. We we're we're uh, we're reaping the benefits of the hot summer right now. Yep. And uh, we're indoors, not enjoying it because we're gonna do a podcast about crime because that's, that's what we do. That's what we do. So true crime people, buckle in. We got another story for you. I don't want to say some cheesy fucking <laughs> like what catchphrase that a lot of podcasts do. Okay, we won't. We're not consistent enough to do that. I don't think. No, mine is, uh, well, oh, wait, we're back. That's mine. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> we're, whoa, good one, Lauren. So good. I right? knocked yourself out on that one. Hey, some of the best uh, quotes are really easy. It's true. Like, keep creeping. Just Let's get it natural. on. Like, doesn't somebody own that? Michael Buffer or something like owns it? Probably, like, yeah. Um, it's see. time. That's what it is. I think Michael Buffer owns It's time. Like, that's pretty simple. Oh. I think I can get We're Back. It's got to be available, right? Okay. Yeah. I figured like that was a movie. Like when we were younger, it was a movie about dinosaurs called We're Back. Oh. You remember that movie? No. No. Let's just do the podcast. Okay. Howdy, folks. Cliff here and I hop with my latest tune. I wake up in the morning empty feeling inside. I need me a hearty meal, so I take a short ride. I get a big two-egg breakfast and it fills me to the top. And now I'm feeling great thanks to my local IHOP. Sorry, folks, but the song's over. Falling. You see, we don't say rising into love. There is in it the idea of the fall. Taking this ghastly risk is the condition of there being life. That's quite mad, because you see, it's letting things get out of control. All sensible people keep things in control. Many of us, if handed the right script and pointed in the right direction, are capable of participating in bloody murder. Just for the thrill of it. Dee always liked to look her best when James Allen Bryan was around. Other employees at the Pancake House had noticed that whenever Allen entered her room, Dee seemed to stand a little taller, smile a little more brightly, speak more slowly, all, 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 all sensible people keep things in control. We are used to thinking that murderers are strangers to us, and that the murders are planned in sleazy places. Bars, bowling alleys, pool rooms. But these murders were planned in a pancake house. An ordinary, wholesome place where you take the kids for strawberry waffles on Sunday morning. The illusion is that if we watch our step, if we stay in the right neighborhoods, if we go only to the safe and familiar places, then we will not be where the murderers are. But if the murderers can stand behind us, filling our tank with gas, or in front of us, wearing cute little aprons, and pouring our coffee, and serving our pancakes, then they can be anywhere. Without mercy, Gary propose. Welcome to the International House of Pancakes. All right, our case this week, Michael chose again. He's on a roll. He's picking. He already picked one for next week too. I'm just gonna let him keep doing it. <laughs> we'll see if I'm on a roll. We'll see how this one goes. Less work for me. That's right. Tell me the audio book to listen to. What to study. <laughs> we'll make it good. And come in here and be ready to host the show. Right. That's all you got to do. I like the one you chose this week again. So I gotta say. I think it's a pretty good one, and it's not very well covered. It's a fun one. It's uh, it's got some creepiness to it, definitely. And it's, got it's got a lot got, of speculation, which we're gonna can, have fun with. And you can put yourself in the place of some of the people in this one, like the main yeah. person in the story. I feel like you can at least the book led you to believe that like this can happen to anybody. I could thing. put myself eating at IHOP, for sure. That's also what I thought about most of the time during I this audio book. I was like, damn, 
I started craving IHOP too, man. man. I almost hit you oh. up and I was like, do you want to get IHOP before we record this week? I we would have would been worthless. I haven't eaten there in so long. Right? Stack of red velvet pancakes. Right. <laughs> Coming down from a sugar coma. Three glasses to do... of milk. Oh. Yeah. So let's talk about the book that we read for this week real quick. You have it in front of you? Uh, I do. Uh, it's Without Mercy, Obsession and Murder Under the Influence by Gary Provost. How did you find this case and how did you find the book for it and all that? Um, I was actually just looking at some top-rated true crime books. Oh, no shit. Yeah, and I stumbled upon that and then started doing a little research. Was it was like, pretty good. Mm-hmm. We talked about it before the show because we both read the book and uh, or listened to the audio book for him. Right. And it was really good, And you said, until after the second murder, and then it, yeah. it kind of drug on a little bit further than it had it's to. It seemed like of, he was filling time. Right. It's, it's, like interest, it's like stuff that, in hindsight, you're like, okay, I'm kind of glad he left that in there, but during, oh, God. Yeah, he's like, dredging through it a little bit. It's a hike. Yeah. yeah. So. But there was a quote from the book that I really liked, and it kind of sums up this case in a sense. Uh, here's the quote. Many of us, if handed the right script and pointed in the right direction, are capable of participating in bloody murder just for the thrill of it. Hmm. And it kind of, it, it's... That's, some, that's gotta be some script. When you think about the main character in this, in this uh, story that we're gonna tell, Dee Castile, mm-hmm. uh, you think about her, it's like... Well, when you think about her in the way she's portrayed in the book. Yes, no doubt. Which, did you, did you go online and look at yeah. some reviews and stuff? There's a lot of people that are upset mm-hmm. with this book because of... Feel because biased, of the way he's portrayed, biased he towards portrayed D. Her. Yeah, and then anything D did bad was because of alcohol or whatever. So, right, we'll, we'll which is not ex- not an excuse. That doesn't mean you're Absolutely that you're forgiven not. because Absolutely oh, it's like not. well, that's not who she was. It was who she was on alcohol. It's like well, that's still who she is. That's <laughs> I drink yeah. beer and I just get happier most of the time. Right, you they know? don't let you out of prison when you sober up. Right, <laughs> if you kill someone in a car wreck because you were drunk, you're still an asshole. It's not like oh, well, he was drunk, so like it's not really who he is. It's like well, he chose to do it. Yeah. You know? That's right. The new alcohol, she knew alcohol was not good for her, and she continued to. That's Granted, right. I know it can, it can be a disease and whatnot. It can be really hard to quit. But, I mean, we'll talk plenty more well, about Well, plenty of people live with that disease every day and don't kill anyone. Right. Or even conspire to kill anyone. Mm-hmm. It seemed like it was a, an excuse for her always. It was like she could, and it was a means to justify. I don't know if it was an excuse. Justify. I don't know if it was an excuse for her so much. It just it seemed like it was an excuse for the author, from the author for her. Yeah, like because it seemed like D came clean in the end, and he even noted that the fact that D sometimes with the right amount of alcohol was a was better, more productive, more charismatic, more confident. Yeah, but she would always push it. Obviously, I mean, right. But um, well, D in the end, we'll get to it. But she came clean, and she knew she was wrong. She felt bad for what she had participated in, Mm -hmm. and so like, what's the point of the author justifying it because she was drunk? And it's yeah. We should really be having this conversation after the podcast, you know, at the end, our little uh, wrap up. Yeah, we should. So let's get into it. <laughs> all right. We can just take this whole portion, put it at the end, <laughs> oh, put, piece nah. it together like a We'll puzzle. just say it all again. All right. <laughs> Filibuster shit. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so D. Castillo, we already talked a little bit about her. She uh, was a woman born June 5th, 1938. She shares a birthday with Kenny G and Mark Wahlberg. Damn. How do you feel about Mark Wahlberg? Uh, I mean, Kenny G's awesome, but Mark Wahlberg. I kind of like Mark Wahlberg, actually. I'm so like, on the fence. Really? Why? I don't like his acting, but I kind of like him. I don't know what it is. What about his music? I feel like in every movie, he's just Mark Wahlberg. Like he's not really <laughs> acting um, as hello. a character. He's just Mark Wahlberg. Uh, why would you be anything different than Wal- only, Mark Wahlberg? Not only that, he mumbles everything, too. Like it's, it's, I think it adds to, like, he thinks it adds mystique or something to it, but it's just like I, I, looking I, away, mumbling every line. In the I movie. like his, like, action comedies. Yeah, oh, yeah I like those. What was the the other guys was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna do a desk pop right now. I gotta go. Do a desk go. pop. <laughs> <laughs> we just start every podcast with a desk pop. <laughs> right. like, yeah, that no. could be our thing, man. You know, some beers that or some uh, shows they like do the pour pouring beer sound yeah. into the. We, we could do get a, a desk cap pop, gun, bro. We could get a cap gun, do a desk pop right up in here, dude. <laughs> The ones with a little flag that says "Hell yes" on air, <laughs> <laughs> on air instead of bang, yeah. <laughs> on air. <laughs> be so corny <laughs> okay so like we said d was born 1938 um she was the ch- love child of her father tom hostetler and his mistress uh was a woman named peggy he was married at the time her father was and uh he ended yeah. up getting he ended up knocking up his mistress which was a woman named peggy and uh their marriage only lasted a year because yeah. he left his wife and went with Peggy, and then it didn't last because it was never really meant to be in the first place. Right. But the damage was done. D was born. <laughs> <laughs> the damage was done. Oh, man. <laughs> it's messed up. Yeah, uh, 
abortions weren't um, widely accepted then. <laughs> yeah. As an understatement. Yeah. We'll talk more about those. Uh, Dee's real mother, Peggy, was a, a severe alcoholic and would end up being institutionalized. And therefore, uh, Dee would end up going to live with her grandmother, yeah, which was she, Peggy's mother. Right. She eventually ended up calling her mama. I mean, mama. That's, you know, it was the only mother she knew. That's the, how young Dee was. These were good years. I guess uh, Mama would take really good care of Dee when she was real young, yeah, would give yeah. her spoiled or gave her whatever she wanted, even though at the time her grandmother, uh, Mama, was uh, in her 30s. She had already had an older daughter. She was done right. with that. She thought she was done with that phase of her life. She was really not wanting this to happen, to right. take on this responsibility, but she did anyway and didn't bitch about it until uh, Dee's father came back into the picture yeah, right. just randomly, like eight years old. Right. This is kind of a weird time. I guess D, looking back, she said like she didn't really understand the situation. Mm-hmm. And she felt like there was like a little bit of guilt. She said, it, looking back now, she felt like it affected her negatively mm-hmm. because she felt like her mama or her grandmother mm-hmm. gave her up too. So now she feels like she's been given up by two mothers. Yeah. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, even though that wasn't the case, mama didn't want, she didn't want to give her away. She just... Her dad didn't have a choice. Really. Yeah, her dad had rights. So. Right. And he would bring her back to be with uh, his old wife that he had left for the mistress in the first place. He got back with her, right? The original yeah, wife. Right. Yeah. And there, there, that wasn't a great household. He was, uh, her father was also an alcoholic. Well, could you imagine living in, living with your husband with a constant reminder of, yeah. of his infidelity right. living with you? How's that going to work out? Right. I mean, she's, even if Dee is the most amazing little girl in the world, the mother, mother, yeah, the mom's yeah. gonna have uh, it's gonna have some uh, yeah some remorse towards her. She's not gonna yeah, yeah she's not gonna accept her as her own daughter. Right. No way. Get real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she started drinking D at a young age and quickly became dependent on alcohol to function. Um, at 17 years old, she would become uh, pregnant from a boy named Harry Osterman. They were technically married, but never lived together or acknowledged. Yeah. Well, the this is this is weird. This is a weird thing. So basically. He got her pregnant, and then her daddy was like, uh, you're going to marry her, you know, one of those old situations. Yeah. And then he was like, okay. And then when they went to go pick him up to go to the courthouse, he had a friend standing outside. You remember this? Yeah. In the book, he had a friend standing outside. He's like, oh, Harry's not coming. Like, what is this, like, fucking sixth grade? <laughs> like, what the fuck are we doing? Oh, uh, Harry doesn't like you anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's got a new girlfriend. They pass notes in class. This is the perfect right? time for a kid presence. Well, Harry doesn't like you anymore. He's probably not going to be seeing He's you. He's been chatting with babes all day, all day online. <laughs> in 1930. They're not pregnant, so. <laughs> no, this would be like the early 50s now. Yeah. Um, there was a moment that even before uh, she got pregnant that her that it still sticks out and was one of the biggest. I think this is when her dad found out she's pregnant. You tell him out when she said when he said that to yeah. her. Yeah. Okay. There was a moment where Dee was hanging out out back with a kid from school, and she was wearing like a halter top, and like I think she was doing laundry or something, right? Right. And so she was just hanging out at the house, and there happened to be a kid that stopped by, and uh, her dad was watching out the window, her talking to this kid. And when she came back inside, her dad basically berated her and uh, verbally abused the shit out of her and said that she was cheaper than piss because of what she was wearing. Yeah. Basically accused her of, you know, She's, trying to attract boy attention by dressing skimpy. Right. And this always stuck out to her. She said it wasn't yeah. – I think, didn't he hit she her? never forgot. No, he, he never hit her. Well, no, I think he did hit her one time here. Oh, okay. um, but she was saying that it wasn't the physical abuse that bothered her. It was the is that quote that she never forgot. And even when mm-hmm. later on when she'd be in prison, she would still bring that up like as the biggest right moment in her <laughs> life that like changed. It wasn't her. being convicted of double murder. It was just uh, it was just what that. Well, no, it's what affected her <laughs> psyche so bad that took right, her on right. the path that ended up where it ended up. Well, yeah, she felt like shit. It yeah. probably you know helped. It fed her alcoholism and everything else too. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, she was uh, still pregnant with Harry's baby, and uh, her dad was pushing her to have an abortion, um, She, but she was already too far along at the point that um, he had found out. Right. And uh, so they ended up delivering a healthy baby boy named Tommy. Um, yep, named after her dad. Yep. And Dee's father, to his credit, would step up, and uh, stepmother Olna would raise them together. Um, it would be end up being more like Dee's br- uh, brother than her right. being like a, fa- uh, a mother to the baby. Right. Um, D dropped out of school and, uh, it was partially due to the pregnancy because in the fifties it was like, you're like yeah. a leper if you were pregnant and pretty much that's how they treated him. Yeah. yeah. Totally socially unacceptable. She would end up going to summer school to get her diploma. She became good friends with the mayor after, uh, after getting her diploma. I don't know how, how did that come about? Do you remember how I she, I think she did like an internship weasel- helping him 
on a, on a campaign or something like that. Yeah, a guy by the just, name of Henry Mylander. And he liked pretty girls around. And, yeah. you know, D's 18. Yeah, she attractive, was pretty girl know. at this time. Um, she became... At this time? <laughs> yeah, at this time. <laughs> Don't Google image. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the, the 60s and 50s here. We're talking about a long time ago. Yeah. By the time it gets to the, the main part of the story, uh, stuff's happened. She's seen yeah. some hard years. <laughs> a lot of cigarettes, a lot of right. alcohol. Right. Um, she began working as uh, his main secretary, and he became kind of a father figure to her. Um, he would help her get out of just about any trouble she got into, whether it was parking tickets, a DUI. Oh, super good friend to have. Right. <laughs> yeah. She I mean, learned, like, p- having powerful friends is, yeah, like, the biggest thing in life sometimes. And then she grew up and we just worked at IHOP and didn't know anybody powerful, so hey, I don't know she how. burned the bridges, man. She, bur- <laughs> she burned the true. bridges. So those. Well, big- didn't that guy die? Yeah. She later stated that if he, if he lived a little longer, maybe her life would have been He different. was on a bridge and she burned it down, so he died. Oh, well, <laughs> actually burned the bridge to him. <laughs> yeah, I got I mean, you. Duh. <laughs> Uh, she would begin dating during this time more prestigious, rich, and sometimes famous men, even though she already had a child with... Watch out now. Right. She's getting fancier. <laughs> <laughs> she seemed like she'd just jump from whatever rich guy came along, and if he if he happened to... Yeah. I guess there was a quote from the book, like, if, if they drank together on the first date, okay. it, would, it would go well. If they didn't drink together on the first date, it wouldn't go well. Yeah. If, you know... So... <laughs> yeah I, I mean, mean that's kind of the rule right <laughs> you're going and meeting drunk guys in bars and then they get you incredibly drunk and then you sleep with them they're not that's not a, that's not how you start a relationship typically right that's, that's probably not going to go your Speak way for yourself bro that's not how it's going to go and it's not going to go your way in the long run i don't think right i don't know maybe did you really get to know each other like really or well, just... well what i'm saying is the men that she was going i'm not saying I, no relationship can start that way but the men that she was going after these rich and powerful guys they're not looking to settle down they're like in their prime they're you know what yeah, I mean? yeah yeah they got a shit ton of money they're right business owners or politicians and they just want to one, one night fling or whatever she's 18 19 years old right That's what this is kind for. of proof right after uh during this time after a date with miami's most eligible bachelor we have no idea who that is quote unquote that's yeah we don't even know if he really is but that's how he's referenced in everything we could find right Makes Young, sense. I guess, good-looking guy Most with a lot of money. Uh, they had, she had a one-night stand with him in which she got pregnant again. Yeah. Now Google image searcher. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this night was also her first time drinking scotch, which would not be her last, to say the least. No, she fell in love with scotch. I've never had scotch. Me either. I feel like it's going to taste like shit. Why are we so poor? Scotch, scotch, scotch. <laughs> Down into my it's belly. A, you think it's going to taste like shit? I don't think so. Dude, it just sounds bad. It looks bad. It looks no. super strong. Looks like you're drinking like brown, fucking. It's probably delicious. Rubbing alcohol. Yeah, maybe brown rubbing alcohol. Hey, anybody like know anybody that makes scotch or know a good scotch you want to send us? We'll try it on the show and then uh, give you. Yeah, our, we our can try li- scotch for the first time. Our live on the reactions. Show. Yeah, <laughs> we should. That'd be good audio. Yeah, we got some whiskey from a listener, which we're going to shout out. Yeah, maybe have a. We may do shout a shout out to later. Little tootski. Little tootski. <laughs> we should do a mid-show tootski after the advertisement. <laughs> All right. See all if right. It, the second half goes better or worse. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so she got pregnant with Miami's most, most uh, eligible bachelor, right. quote unquote. And uh, but then she never saw the guy again. The man f- had flown to California and she could not locate him. Yeah, I feel like she missed an opportunity to, here. If she could have gotten a lawyer or something, yeah. and, and at least gotten a nice payday out of this. Well, yeah, for her troubles. And to be fair, this dude didn't leave her high and dry. He had no idea. She just kept it from him. Right. Because she felt like she was going to ruin his life. Again, going back that to... That was considerate, at least. Go, going back to, you are piss. <laughs> Cheap as piss or oh, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Her self-esteem is really low. Yeah. I feel like that's where it came out. When she when she sobered up, she thought, oh, God, who am I? This guy's right. got his whole life ahead of him. He's already mm-hmm. successful. You know, why, why am I going to bring him down with this? This is a sad story that happens a lot, just in, in general, in life. In every city, it was a cyclical thing where... But I think in the 50s, it was more prominent. No, but I mean, it just goes on and on, though, where parents uh, are shitty parents, and then they have kids who end up being shitty parents, and a lot of- they don't know anything. You need someone yeah. to break that cycle, and it's, it's you know, yeah. sadly, sometimes it just keeps going, where you have an abusive parent, and then yeah. the kid goes on to abuse their kids, or someone else's kids, and so on and so forth. Right. And then, you know, obviously, some people break the mold, and they do exactly the opposite, because they would never want to do that to yeah. someone else. And then they raise spoiled but kids. But in this case, they, no. <laughs> right? in this case, it seems to be the prior, where it's- you know, it, the cycle continued, and it from is. from D's parents to D to Even D, D to D's really daughter, an abusive did, parent though, 
Was she? No, but she... Really. Well, verbally, yes, when she would drink. Yeah. We'll get there. Okay. <clears throat> um, so she would end up getting a abortion this time. It's, this is not something regular. This is not something... No, it's not you go to a clinic. This was a no. back alley deal type of thing. Yeah, it was... Because abortions weren't legal yet. There wasn't a Roe versus Wade yet. Right. That's right. And so this was like, a, what did they... They inserted air into her uterus or something. That's just right. so... Ugh. And it just kind of killed out. the baby eventually. I, but, I got woozy when I heard this part of the book. It was just no good. Yeah, it was pretty graphic. She, yeah, it's just, basically, she she passed the fetus on yeah. the toilet Ugh. and then did not pass the afterbirth, though, which almost killed her. Yeah. It almost killed her. Like, she was having these horrible pains, like, the next day mm-hmm. and finally went in to see the doctor, and, you know, they helped her pass it or whatever. But he said, if you didn't come in, if you had to wait another day, you'd be dead. Right. That's, that's scary, man. <laughs> Yeah, super. <laughs> That's why we have cl- clinics, people. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, oh, and by the way, like this back alley abortion cost five hundred dollars, which was a lot of money mm-hmm. for their family back then. And um, nobody, she didn't want to bug the bachelor guy about it, so she actually got Henry Mylander, her the political hookup that we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah, he, he paid for the abortion, and it also um, made it to where she wasn't able to have kids again without getting something That's fixed. Right. That's right. With later the complications on. she had, she was she was messed up, out of commission. But she for did a while. later have medical procedures yeah. to correct it. Yep. Um, she would end up being fired from her job. She had a good job during this time, but when they found out about the abortion, they actually fired her over it. We talked yep. about how it was illegal during the time, yep. and this was just another kind of step back in her life. She had, she seemed like she was on the right path during this time. She was, she was in with the important people in town, right? In the Miami area, she was getting good jobs. She was very bright. But she do was, you think it was really because of the abortion or the alcoholism? Because it says probably. abortion they, and alcoholism. How, okay. How, why would you tell your boss you had an abortion? Right. How did the boss? How are they going to know? How yeah. are they going to know? Well, maybe because she got like sick. At, like we said, she had to be hospitalized because she almost died from the. But even then, you don't have to tell your boss you went to the hospital. You might need a doctor's note. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. That's pretty shitty. Yeah, and then the doctor throws in there that she was drinking scotch the whole time. <laughs> there you go. We didn't even give her any pain meds. <laughs> <laughs> she said she didn't need any. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so like I was saying, though, was like during this time, she was doing really she's doing really well for herself. She was on the yeah. right path. If you're looking at her, her life on paper, you go, this, this woman's going somewhere. Right. Um, but then it was just one step after another, mistake after a mistake, and, and it basically like it all goes back mistake, to alcohol, dude. though. Yeah, it goes back yeah. to alcohol. Well, she also got into bowling at this time. Well, she was a badass bowler. Yeah, from what her, we, from her what dad we heard, taught her to bowl, I think. Like right? the best female bowler in the Miami area yeah. is what we've heard, right? Like they wanted her, okay. <laughs> a picture with like the orange <laughs> Steven Seagal glasses, yeah. <laughs> just lighting it up. Wrist brace, right? Sitting there, high socks. Right. Oh, uh, she's probably killing it. Right. But um, I thought about this, you know, they didn't sponsor because they wanted it to be like a wholesome family thing i'm like who bowls and doesn't drink seriously like she is the perfect person for bowling you were so right i didn't even think i didn't consider that dude bowling if you watch that's on the resume like okay so you drink how much a day okay that's you're gonna need to take that up a notch and uh what's your nacho intake can you bowl with a (laughs) bottle in the other hand (laughs) we're gonna need (laughs) like it's you look at live bowling I mean, you watch bowling like on ESPN. I mean, you know, by accident, Dude, that of course. So no one's actually doing no, it. No, I watch it. No, you're not. I you're watch lying. It. I'm telling you right now, watch it. It's so entertaining because those dudes take it so seriously and they're wearing the orange <laughs> glasses. Strike and, after strike and, after strike. And, dude. But, bro, they get so fired up and they got the crowd going and the crowd's going crazy. It's if hilarious. If you bowl a 299, you fucking lost. You're done. What are you talking about? If you, if you don't bowl a perfect game, you lose. No, you don't. Dude, they, they all average in like the 230s, 240s. Oh, no, they don't. Yes, they do. It's ridiculous. Dude, it's it's still rare for the pros to roll a 300, Anyways, I think. Anyways, when you're flipping through there, you we're look at the We're going down banners. a bowling alley here. We're, going down, at, <laughs> we're going down a bowling alley. Wow, nice. <laughs> we're, if you look at the like the background, it's always like beer advertising. It's like Budweiser, Miller Lite. It looks like a fucking NASCAR race out there. Yeah. And then they're talking like, oh, we, can, we don't need alcoholics. And then like, right. yeah, you definitely need alcoholics. Right. You need I, I literally saw a pro bowler it. that had a beer can inside his clear ball, dude. He takes a sip from one of the holes and then throws it <laughs> strike every time every time beer goes everywhere sponsored by miller high, miller living the high life living the high life oh, jesus like every night recording all right so but i guess yeah she she lost another opportunity supposedly to become a pro bowler because of her drinking habits they they Man. you know the fbi looked into her and they're like eh, she's not fit for this bowling thing she's the uh, fbi word on the, word on the street is she's got a uh, is problem that the with federal bowling incorporated exactly. Exactly. Is it really? No, I'm kidding, man. Oh, I was like, <laughs> the FBI. 
But seriously, that's in this book. It talks about how she was about to be a pro bowler yeah, and really, then her yeah. drinking sidetracked it. It's like, uh, now that you say that, I'm just, I don't buy it. I don't buy it either. I don't buy it. I don't think she was that great at bowling. I think this is all a bunch of malarkey. Yeah. She could have said whatever. It's it's mostly her You know, account. she had a 180 average. She was looking good. She was, like, <laughs> <laughs> she was the hot kid on the town, but the scotch got to her. <laughs> she was bowling good for a lady. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, you're gonna get oh, us in trouble. oh, man, it's all over now. Right. <laughs> she, uh, so after being fired from that and then losing out on the bowling thing, uh, she met a guy by the name of Lester Wallace at a cocktail lounge, and before long they would get married. Um, she was that type, I guess, you know, that, after well, Les- a night of drinking, it sounds like a good idea, right? Let's go get, well, let's Lester, go get hitched. Lester was her type. She looked for that certain What, guy. a drinker? Rich, successful, big guys. It's a bit abusive. That's abusive. Got to got to got to throw some hands, smack around a little bit. That's right. <laughs> What's the fun in that? What's the fun in not having that, right? Right. Um, they would end up uh, wanting to have a baby, and uh, she would end up getting her whatever parts. Yeah, repaired. he paid. He paid to have surgery, reproductive yeah. surgery, and they would have a baby uh, named Susan after the uh, damage was sur- surgically corrected in 1966. Right. After having Susan, she would be sober for a year, and everything was great. This is probably the best time of her life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because she, did, she, she didn't have to work. Lester made enough money for her. She was able to stay she was home. She clean. She enjoyed her daughter. Yep. She spent most of her time with Susan, so she wasn't on the bottle all the time. But it, as with Dee, it seemed like it was always a ticking time bomb before. she. There was period, periods where she would quit. Although, was this one her fault, though? I feel like Lester had a freak out, at least according to the, the book. Oh, This is yeah. where Lester has that breakdown. Yeah. Like everything was going fine and even she thought everything was going fine. And then Yeah, well this is what happened. One night yeah. after hitting several bars together, saw that she was already drinking. <laughs> Unless she was there just to be the designated driver. Well, I mean, you know, completely sober a for an alcoholic. Drinks. That's what drinks on the weekends, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, after a, a night of hitting, hitting several bars together, Dee and Lester started heading home. Les wanted to stop for one more drink, but Dee argued that they had to go home and take care of the baby, so maybe she wasn't an alcoholic during this time. Right. When they arrived home, Les freaked out, um, got his gun, and threatened to kill Dee. Um, she then went to her friend Henry Mylander, right? What? Where are the missing pieces to the story? Every time I heard it, like I kept trying to dig to figure out more details because it just don't make sense. What doesn't make sense? How it escalates from we need, let's go to a bar and no, let's go home to dude, I'm gonna you're kill you. Uh, alcohol. That's how it progresses. That dude, it does not make you very. Something else happened on that ride home. They got into a big ass. Well, yeah, I mean we're something. summarizing here, so who yeah. knows? Maybe she said something about his father. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? She, you know, sometimes women know how to push the right button. Right, right. She might have said something. Yeah, I hate your mother. Right. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. It just it just seems like it escalated way too too quickly. And then of course this is mostly Dee's account, so right. she's making Lester look like the complete asshole in this situation, which he may have been. Right. And according to her, it took three hours for the cops to show up after he threatened to kill her, um, so she could retrieve her belongings. Uh, but they would not take her complaint because she'd been drinking. Apparently he Boom. was friends with like a couple of the deputies or yeah. the sheriff or something. That's what she gets for dating all these rich and powerful guys. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Although she had somebody more powerful because she oh. then called Henry Mylander, the mayor, Bum, and asked him to have Les arrested, and uh, they were divorced soon after that. And Henry took care of that, no problem. And then he's like, I know, anything, that's crazy. Any, anything else I can do for you? And she's like, well, I can use a job. <laughs> sure enough, he gets her a job as a yeah. police dispatcher. Which proves to be pretty helpful. Well, that's what she always wanted. It's well, sound, she wanted it to be a police like officer. She, so yeah. she thought this is her way to get her foot in the door. You know, well... She ended up going the opposite direction, I guess. That's why we're talking about her. Right. She's taking calls, taking a swig, taking calls. <laughs> no. <laughs> she ended up being a murderer later on, but right. that's beside the point. That's neither here nor there. Right. Uh, now, around this time, uh, 1969 is where we're at. Dee's biological mother, Peggy, uh, we, she hasn't been in the picture for a long time, obviously. Yeah, since she was an infant. Right. Um, she's now married to uh, an officer named Bob DeSalvo, and they're living in Tampa, which is... Obviously not far from Miami. Right. I think it was like, yeah, I think it was like five hours or something. Five hours away or so. And uh, she's now hitting up D and trying to get her to move up to Tampa. She misses her daughter, I guess. Yeah. Wants to be involved in her life. Yeah, um, now that she's got her shit together, she doesn't have to change any diapers. Right. She can wipe her own ass. Hey, come live with me now. Right. <laughs> Um, so D would, uh, do a trial run. She would go up to Tampa for two weeks and visit and, uh, she right. liked, liked it. She decided she was going to make the move. Um, she went back to Miami to pack her stuff to move to Tampa when she got a phone call from her mother, Peggy, who said that Bob, uh, her husband at the time had committed suicide. Um, this isn't such a weird thing. A little weird. 
Because the timing it's, is weird. Although it's not proven, D to this or not to this day, she's gone now. But at the time, she believed that Peggy had shot him because he was abusive. Yeah. So she believes her mother committed murder and said it was suicide. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? I what just, do you think? It's a little weird because we know where D's headed. You know, just yeah, drinking and killing seems to be also, in the family. Bob took to um, Susan and D pretty pretty well as too don't you, you think that maybe her mom had a little bit of jealousy in that because they're you know so much younger and stuff i don't know did he take to her i didn't what during yeah. that two weeks you're talking about yeah like oh, when they came her. down and visited like bob really took to d and susan hmm. and that's why that's what made that's what put d at ease it's like okay yeah maybe we can make this work okay yeah and then he just winds up dead right oh that's mm. right yeah he was calling and saying he was real excited yeah yeah and then right. he's just then he's dead very strange it, it is strange Hmm. Like some Eileen Warno stuff going on. Remember when her mom was like jealous of her and stuff? Yeah. It's weird. Now, this would not deter Dee from uh, giving Tempa a chance. She would end up taking Susan and moving in with Peggy. There she uh, met quickly a new man. She's just, just alcohol and men, new well, men. same guy, new name. <laughs> yeah, right. Another big, uh, big aggressive guy that liked yeah. to drink. Uh, this time it was a guy by the name of Charlie White. Again, an alcoholic. She ended up having two sons with uh, Charlie. Um, by the name of Todd and Wyatt. Yeah, they were just a year apart. Right. So Now, here they move back to Miami, right? Yeah. And she would be, be on the fast track to being a, one of Miami's first female police officers. She was at the top of her class. That's right. Um, and yeah, through her dispatcher experience, she was able to kind of get in. And, get her foot in the door. Yeah, she knew some people in the area. Started doing like the cadet thing. and uh, Apparently, she was, she was beast at that too, according to her. Yeah, apparently so, physically at the top and then also killing but, it on the tests and everything. But, but man, who knew the cops would check your background? Like, right, talk fuck? to your friends and find out that you're <laughs> right. into drinking. Dude, you got well, the she got kicked off the, She got kicked off the Pro Bowl and tour because of the scotch. <laughs> oh, and it's like, shit. damn, she's that bad, huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> she's that bad. She's that bad. God, if you drink too much for bowling, honey, <laughs> right. we're going to have to I pass. I don't know police works for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have you co- cruising around in cruisers with a bottle <laughs> right. of scotch. You got a stenographer position. <laughs> She imagine her pulling someone over, and she's like, "I smell scotch in your breath." Wait, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, they'll be like, "I smell scotch on your breath." <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, so she would end up getting not that opportunity would be wasted again to be a police officer, and we're just seeing one after another, burn bridge, burn bridge. But this one hurt her though. This was one of her dreams: become a police officer. Right. This one really hit her hard. Hit her where she lived. Even still, she got one more opportunity. It had a good job. Um, she started working at the gas company. This went on for a year. Um, she had a decent position there, too, to the point where she was like, it had her hand in the billing aspect of taking in, mm-hmm. and uh, that didn't go well. A little too good of a position for she her. She started putting in IOUs. People would pay, and it would be like a, a lapse between when the the, right. the money would be owed and well, when Well, there's different zones pay. of the city where, where your bill is due. Right. So, yeah, like people would pay weeks early. So she would borrow fifty to a hundred dollars here, and then in hopes to put it back before their bill was actually due. But then she would take other people's money to pay the one that she already. Yeah. So like if she borrowed fifty dollars in one in one phase of it or whatever, she would borrow a hundred in the next, give yeah. the fifty back, and then borrow fifty again, and then so on. And so this on. got so out of hand that after about a year, she had racked up fourteen thousand uh, dollars <laughs> before finally being caught and it's fired, unreal. and obviously fired. Yeah. And that was said that in the book, they said that this was like the big one. This is the one where she went from being able to have like white collar, good jobs to yep. she was basically. She was done. This outcasted. Her. Yeah, she was outcasted. Her, I'm sure Henry Mylander probably disowned her at this point. Uh, Mylander, Mylander passed away at some point. Is that point what time happened? Right okay, so she lost yeah. her powerful friend as yeah. well. Um, at this point, she started working the uh, bar and restaurant scene. Uh, Which, being a waitress. And, again, can't drink while you work in the bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a no no. I mean, I why would you put an alcoholic as a bartender? I feel like that's the perfect job for a bar t- for an alcoholic. They don't they don't drink that much in the bar. They should. A lot of a lot of a lot of bartenders will pretend drink too. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. Where they got like an empty water bottle and they take yeah. a swig of the drink and they yep. keep it in their mouth and spit it into the water bottle. Yeah. Do people really do that though? If you're a bartender, Probably. hit us up and tell us your tricks. I want to know. Well, you can't just be wasted like giving people change, taking money, remembering drink orders. Unless you're real good at it. That's D could have yeah, done it. Maybe. She yeah. seemed like she's better yeah. when she's drinking. Yeah. D man. One bottle of scotch, she'd probably kill it. Oh, dude. <laughs> Two bottles? I don't know. She may be forgetting an order here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she bounced around from job to job. Um, she also met a man named Cass during this time, another alcoholic and wife beater. 
So I guess she had broken up with Charlie, right? Yeah. When she started working at the restaurants and stuff, she divorced Charlie because her and Charlie, she said later, weren't really that compatible. They were just like drinking buddies. Mm -hmm. And they basically just got tired of hanging out, kind of. <laughs> just got tired of the, I guess, the romantic part of the relationship. So, mm -hmm. But he lived with her for a little while before she met Cass. He just oh, okay. kept living there. Like, they were just like roommates. That seems like that's how it was with her. Like, they, she would meet a guy and they'd be drinking friends, but they probably didn't really like each other if they weren't drunk, you know? Yeah. Yeah, probably. And then they weren't really attracted to each other either, she said. They just weren't. Hmm. Just weren't really compatible as far as that goes. But, you know, as they say in life, around the corner is another drunken douchebag that you can get with. And that, the yeah. next one was a guy that named... magical the, phrase. Yeah, guy, a guy by the name of Cass. <laughs> uh who she would get with, uh, another alcoholic and wife beater. <sighs> Did not see that coming. And she's bouncing from job to job. She's getting fired from like each restaurant that she works at on this. At this time, she's, uh, she's living and working in a town called Naranja, Florida, which is about 35 miles south of Miami. It's still in Dade County. Right. And I looked it up, Naranja. It's, like, it's still like, it's only like a population of 8,300 or something to oh. this day. So it's just... Oh. It's basically just south of Miami, though. It's kind of some. They basically the people that live there say they live in Miami, but yeah, the it's people that live in Mi the people that suburb. live in Miami say that the people that live in Naranja don't live in Miami. It's, oh, I, that's the kind of sense I get. Yeah, it's more. Yeah, like you said, rural. It's it's like Pahrump corporate Vegas. land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you live in the Vegas area, if you live in Pahrump, they probably say they live in Vegas. But we're yeah. like, no, those are Pahrump people. Those are Pahrumps. Yeah. Pahrumpians. <laughs> yeah, those Pahrumpians. <laughs> Naranja though sounds like they get good ganja out there. Huh? That's right, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Ganja did Naranja. Ganja. She's basically uh, jumping from restaurant to restaurant in Naranja, and they discover her alcoholism. She has to be drunk on the job. That's the only way she can get through the day. She she basically gets the shakes and everything. It's that bad yeah. that if she so she's trying to sneak swigs and everything, and she yeah. keeps getting fired from each one. And eventually, Putting alcohol into regular oregano bottles and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Eventually, she ends up at the IHOP in Naranja. This is like the last last step and this is yeah. where we should take a break because this is where the story goes into the second phase where she meets her new IHOP family and yeah. shit gets crazy she Shit's meets the devil on her shoulder shit goes awry we'll be right back after this all right michael let's talk about our friends over at casper mattress casper is a sleep brand that has created an outrageously comfortable mattress sold directly to consumers eliminating commission-driven inflated prices its award-winning sleep surface was developed in-house, has a sleek design, and is delivered in a small, how-did-they-do-that size box. In addition to the mattress, Casper also offers an adaptive pillow and soft, breathable sheets. The mattress industry has forced consumers into paying notoriously high markups. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing that savings directly to the consumer. An in-house team of engineers spent thousands of hours developing the Casper. It combines supportive memory foams for a sleep surface that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus, its breathable design sleeps cool to help you regulate your temperature through the night. Yeah, don't be one of those people that's walking through life with an achy back and you're tired because you didn't get enough sleep. Right. You don't realize that you thought you got a good night's sleep, but your mattress is keeping you up. You're rolling yeah. around. You're you don't want to wake up all sweaty either. Right. It's like the worst. We've wake all Wake up all there. sweaty. Get it. Get kill it. yourself off the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Velcro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the convenience. Buying a Casper mattress is completely risk-free. Casper offers a free delivery and free returns with a 100-night home trial. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. Right. We've it, talked about it. It's like being with a lover, man. you got to choose the right mattress. That's right. You're going to spend so much time with them. Right. Okay, so let's review. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. The product design features a marriage between foam layers for ideal firmness, just the right sink, and just the right bounce. It's affordable price because Casper sells directly to consumers. Free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada. 100-night trial with free, no-hassle returns if you're not happy. And with over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. That's based on Casper, Amazon, and Google reviews. Designed, developed, and assembled in the USA. Love that. So when you add all this together, you can't go wrong. Right. And you get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com forward slash creeper and using promo code creeper at checkout. That's casper.com forward slash creeper. Use promo code creeper at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. All right. Let's get back to the show. Real quick, I want to thank Cassandra in Ireland for the uh, shot of Jameson that we just did during the break. Yes, it was delicious. We'll see how the second half goes. Right. It's going to be a smooth operation, I think. <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's going to be a shit show. <laughs> so, Isn't where it we, always? Yeah. Where we left off, um, 
D starts working at the I, the IHOP in Naranj, Florida. Mm-hmm. She starts working at this IHOP, and this is like this is she's one of those women. It's like her work became her life. Like she needed this job. She was mm-hmm. the, like she was so afraid to lose this job, and that's where a lot of this next. Well, she was making decent money as a waitress here. Yeah, we, you know, I think she's making over a hundred bucks a day, right? And like when yeah. you include tips and everything. Oh right. And this is the '80s, so it's mm-hmm. pretty good money. Absolutely. I didn't know how people could make that much in tips, man. Dude, waitresses can make bank. Making that pancake Working at money. the right place in the right hours. Right. They make better than management sometimes. Something special about, like, diners. and st- I just love diners. Yeah. It's got, it's got warmth. It's got culture. I mean, culture. It's, that's a, obviously a very corporate diner. It's not your typical hometown, small No, diner. but the people that are there are from your town, though. Yeah. I mean, just because the exterior is whatever. Everybody's IHOP, I think, kind of has that homey feeling. Kind of like the Waffle House. When you go to Waffle House, you're like, yeah, these are my people up in here. Right. Yeah, it's like the the non alcoholic version of a bar where you go there. It's like, hey, there's Bill over there with yeah. his coffee and his, his coffee and his, his all star special. Yeah, <laughs> you want the bacon crispy again, Jim? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I already got your order. I already know. That's right. Yeah, so she starts working here, and there she would meet uh, the guy who is currently running the place at the time mm-hmm. by the name of James Allen Bryant. He was a 26 year old. Um, he's the acting manager. Basically, he didn't own it though. He was partnered up with a guy named Arthur. Well, he Art- was just managing it. He was managing it for the owner, Arthur Art Venetia, which yeah. was his boyfriend at the time. Exactly. They were a gay couple. Um, James Allen Bryant was dating Art, who owned it, and Art kind of right. like gave it to him as a, a, a way to keep James busy. Yeah, kind of keep him out of trouble. Art is a good bit older than James. He's yeah, quite a he's bit. About twenty years. I think he was actually. like forty four or something yeah. during the time. He's forty four. James and well, let's call him Allen. Let's call it James Allen Bryant. Let's yeah. call him Allen. He liked to call him. He called him Allen. Whatever. So he's like twenty five. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he basically he bought this restaurant. Art bought this restaurant for Alan to manage. I mean, right. that was the, the sole purpose. Yeah. Art had made some good investments. He had some money. Like we said, he's an older guy. He had mm-hmm. bought a big property um, yeah. in Miami or in the Miami area, like five acres with like a, you know, big wooded area. Right. He built his own house on it. Everything was going great for Art. Uh, he was, he was in the golden years and he had his young boyfriend and he just wanted, he just wanted uh, Bryant to be happy. Yeah, he really are we calling dated. him Alan? We'll call him Alan. Yeah, call he him. wanted Alan to be happy, and Alan was restless, so he gave him this IHOP to to manage, and he thought maybe that would fix their issues, and they could live yeah. ha- happily ever after on his big property. And right, and uh, so it's like he just kept trying to buy his love, man. It just yeah, he was kind of got sad after a while. Yeah, well, Alan happened to be in love with a man named Henry Ramos at the time, so he had. He had a lover on the side, right? A Cuban man. He was very attracted to the Cubans. Yeah, well, th- at this time, we were talking about Miami in the 80s. And oh, right, yeah. The pop- I think it was Cuban what Fidel, population is very high. Fidel had, like, given a U.S., like, a ton of Cuban people. Yeah, because like, we were accepting refugees, so they're like, he's like, oh, you're accepting refugees? We'll have these. Have here, the worst people of my country. Here you go. And, but a lot, along with them came a lot of just normal people, too, or like, yeah, people, yeah, like yeah. people who were into prostitution or, like, did minor crimes that yeah. wouldn't be a big deal we're here. We're not talking about, they didn't send us a bunch of Cuban serial killers. Like, these were pretty petty thieves here. Right. So D starts working here at this IHOP. It's being run by uh, Alan, and she is like she wants his attention. She wants to. Be, I think she's afraid to lose her job. Is the way that the book said it. But he would come in, and she would like all of a sudden spruce up her. No, there was something something more than that though. She was kind of infatuated with him for yeah. whatever reason, which was so strange because he wasn't her type. No, he was not he her was type at all. More effeminate. We said right. he was a gay man. She and was when, into the big burly, abusive drinking type yeah. guys. <laughs> The lumberjack that slaps you around a little bit. I don't know. He hasn't even hit me yet. I don't think he likes me. I don't think he likes me. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he wouldn't even, like, flirt with her or anything. But you got to remember, Dee's in her mid-40s, too. Yeah. She's Art's age. And she was used to getting a lot of attention. We said she was good-looking when she was younger. And Mm -hmm. I think part of it is that Alan would come in. He would be flirting with the younger waitresses and whatnot. And then he would kind of leave her alone. Yeah. There's some talk in the book about maybe Alan being bi. I don't know. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, his actions didn't display any of that. No. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe, you know, it's kind of human nature. You kind of want what you can't have. Yeah. And, you know, and she's probably reminiscing the back when, you know, she was a fox back in the day in her 20s. And it's mm-hmm. like, here's a 20, you know, mid 20s guy. Right. Who she sees on the daily. And he's rolling up. They had a, right. What, what? And he's homosexual. That's even more of a challenge. He had what, like an old, he had like an Oldsmobile <laughs> that he would roll up, right? A Lincoln. A Lincoln. That was bought by Art. Yeah, right. He bought him a Lincoln Town Car. We talked about Art trying to buy Alan's love yeah, awesome. constantly. Anything yes. Alan wanted, bought Art him this brand buy. new town car. Right. 
And so. he and Alan was taking money from the IHOP. It's a good time to mention that. Well, Alan would come in, and that was kind of his salary. Was yeah, they had an agreement. He didn't get an official salary, but he could just take what he wanted. Not smart on Art's part. Not smart. You're trying to run Art. a franchise here, and it's like, eh, just take money from the register whenever you want. It's like, yeah. dude, this dude's just gonna. Uh, how about every day? Especially if you know Alan's character. <laughs> you know, he he had to have known Alan's character a bit and known that Alan could not help himself. That's the ultimate. The, the ultimate downfall of this entire story was Alan's lack of control yep. in general, just in life. He had no self-control. No, he really didn't. He had no willpower. No willpower. Yeah, he just did what he, he wanted. Run he wanted. by the id part of the mind. Right. Like, whatever he wanted, he had to have it. Yeah, well, there was the word was getting around the IHOP that every time Alan would come in, that D would spruce herself up. She would run to the bathroom, clean herself up, and like yeah. put, on, put on her best, start walking in those heels a little bit better, <laughs> and, you know, like put on a big smile, and... Yeah. Try to impress Alan every time he came in. She right. wanted his approval, whether it was because she was afraid to get fired or whether it was because right. she was, like you said, infatuated with him. It really didn't, no one really knew, but the word was that she had like a crush on him. Yeah. She'd like wipe the jelly off her apron. Right. She's like, he might, he might look at me today. Right. And so <laughs> one day, um, Alan comes in and he actually comes up to Dee and asks her if, if he could talk to her and says, come on, let's go take a ride in my Lincoln and they well, go for a cruise, right? Well, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. First, uh, he came in one day like he always does, okay, to the cash oh, register. Right. He almost found her bottle. Money. Yeah, and her bo- she was sharing her bottle of oregano <laughs> or scotch. Of all things, why oregano? Why not know. like, I don't know, corn syrup or something that looks a little like I feel like, like that's scotch. what you would hide your weed in, like an oregano bottle. <laughs> yeah, not scotch. <laughs> not scotch. Right? Like, syrup, maybe? Why syrup? is this oregano so liquidy? Dude, you're in a pancake house. Get a fucking syrup, <laughs> Get a syrup bottle. bottle. What the hell's wrong Anything. with this chick? Yeah, right. You could carry the syrup bottle with you. It's in your pouch. God, she was a drunk. Oregano? <laughs> but oregano. It'd, be, it'd be awkward if the customer asked for syrup. Be like, um, you got some right there, ma'am. No, yeah. no let, me, let me go get... No, you got it right there. Just put it on my damn pancake. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. You asked for it. You asked for it. But anyways, so he was getting money from the register. Mm-hmm. And her oregano bottle was right there on the floor behind the register because she had been sharing it with another employee. The chef. Yeah. Was a, was it an was an alcoholic. Alcoholic, well. alcoholic. So he, was, he forgot to put it back in her purse. Mm-hmm. Which I don't know why you put it in a regular bottle, then put it in your purse. Like nobody's going through that. But right. anyways, but he, uh, she had hoped that he didn't notice it, and she went over there and had small talk with him, and he walked out and left. So she goes on about her business, and he comes back. Mm-hmm. He comes back for whatever reason, and then notices it in the floor, picks it up, unscrews the lid, smells it, screws it back, puts it back. Now he's got something on her. And the, yeah, and and it. It tortured her because the next two days were her days off. Yeah. And the next morning on her day off, he calls her and he's like, "Do you need to come down to the oh, restaurant?" That's right. That's how this went. Yeah. Down. And she's like, "Oh shit, I'm fired." Yeah. <laughs> she she even took all her uniforms and everything, had them all folded up, cleaned. In Do you the think car. maybe he toyed with her, like, because she was worried when he was initially at the register, the bottle was sitting right there. She's like, all she could do is take. She could not take her eyes off of it. Like, what if yeah, he kept glancing? What down if he's going to see? It. He probably saw it initially and then left just to torture her more and came back and yeah. found it. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like going to make her think I. And see it and then i'm gonna come back when she's like all relieved and then find yeah. it again right anyways but now he it, it kind of added something that he had that over her like he could have yeah. fired her right there but mm-hmm. he didn't but so that kind of like added to the influence of him over her so when he comes when she comes back from her days off or he calls her on her day off right hey d can i talk to you let's go for a ride picture yeah. up picture which up she was Lincoln. ecstatic yeah. to go in a ride with him she's like oh my god you know even if i am getting fired she's well, like no, i'm in his car she thought he she <laughs> Basically thought that yeah. the uh, talk was her getting fired. She actually right, folded right. up her work clothes and brought yeah, that's them what with I said. her. Yeah. Okay. So she brought all that. She, yeah, she was ready to be fired. Yeah. And then they, you know, so they go out riding and he's like, starts off right away. He's like, I know about the oregano bottle. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Yeah. He's like, don't worry about it. We need to stick together, you know, people like me and you and whatever. And this is where she was excited. She was like, oh, okay. I guess he just wants to hang out with me on my day off. Mm-hmm. But of course, like anybody who shows sudden interest in you, they want something from you. Get the skeptical snake That's look. That's it. Yep. So yep. Get that one eyebrow going. Right. I, mm. Dude, I was just about to say that. <laughs> we were on a wavelength today. It must right. be the whiskey. Well, you did the eyebrow, so that's why I said it. Oh, okay. Did I do it subconsciously? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, then he asked her. He comes out of the blue with the craziest question. He's like, don't you know someone who will take a contract? And yeah. She's well, like... This being this being the IHOP uh, vibe where it's like cheers at you know everybody knows a guy at, yeah. at the IHOP. There's the one guy that comes in that says he'll he'll take a hit on your. There was a the one guy that would be that been coming in all the time, Mike. Yeah, guy named Mike, average guy. Everybody liked him, seemed really friendly, and yeah. he, there was a running joke where he would come in and and everyone knew that Dee didn't like her husband at the time, Cass. Who yeah. we talked about right. 
And he would come in and go, you want me to knock off uh, Cass yet? He was a friend of Cass's, supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want me to kill you that husband of yours that you can't yeah. stand yet? And it was a running joke. And she went by his gas station a lot, too. He worked at a service station mm-hmm. where he was like a you know, general maintenance mechanic. And it was one of the, the ones where they pump your gas for you and stuff. Clean your windows. There's still a few of those such. around. But um, yeah, and so she, he would say that to her there, too. He'd be like, you know, you ready for me to knock off that husband yet? Right. And so she would tell other people and joke about it. And uh, and he wasn't quiet about it, so I'm sure everybody in the IHOP would, you know, hear the jokes going around. Yeah, exactly. But, and she hey, was like, how you oh, doing? You, you got anybody you want killed? Uh, hey, hey, you need somebody whacked? <laughs> I don't know why they talk Let like that. Let me get some syrup. You want Florida. somebody whacked? <laughs> <laughs> syrup bottle's empty. Who do I got to kill around here to yeah, get some who syrup? Do I gotta, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but... He, so she's like, oh, you mean my friend Mike? And she's like, starts laughing. He's like, he's a teddy bear. He would never yeah. hurt anybody. But then she realizes at that point that Alan's serious. He's right. like, yeah. And she you, feels like she's gotten his approval and like his acceptance and she doesn't want to yeah. lose. She doesn't want to lose it. Right. She's afraid that if she says no, like he's, a, you know, initially she goes, he's a teddy bear. And Brian's yeah. like, uh, Alan's like, oh, okay. Well now, now she's like, fuck, he doesn't like me again. Yep. <laughs> but wait a second, wait a second. Maybe, maybe he knows a guy yeah, that maybe, would, maybe he knows a guy who knows a guy who would kill somebody. Right, right. So I'll, I think I'll he's, ask, I think he's a small time weed dealer. <laughs> right. I'll ask, I'll ask him. Right. And, and so now Alan's like, okay, cool. Now she's like, okay, he's accepting me again. She wants that approval so yep. bad. This yep. is really where this shit starts is mm-hmm. her alcoholism. And then also her just needed to be approval, which may have gone back to her father saying she's worthless and pissed. Plus her fascination with Alan for whatever reason. Yeah. So yeah, it was a cocktail of Well, it may disaster. have been that he ignored her and like you said, you want what you can't have. Yeah. And her dad It had, became a conquest. Maybe because her dad had hurt her uh, self esteem so much when she was younger, she wanted approval of guys who didn't accept her or whatever and that may have gone back to it. You're a regular Dr. Phil sometimes. Well, you need to do. What you need to do, honey. Listen. <laughs> honey, listen. Okay, you're not as worthless as piss. Maybe shit. <laughs> Maybe shit sometimes. <laughs> Put down the bottle once in a while. Yeah. But that, what you need to do is hand me that bottle of scotch. <laughs> Now I'm gonna put this in my pocket and go hit it in the back <laughs> real quick. I'll be we'll be back after commercial. Let me test it for you. <laughs> that scotch all right. It's pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> right. So she agrees. She tells Alan that she will talk to her friend uh, Mike about this potential hit right, on. Right. And why? And why is it you think that he wanted um, Arthur to be hit? He's just. Arthur's old. He's um, there's, there's a, he's got his young boyfriend. There's a multiple of reasons. Um, I think one, yeah, he has his boyfriend that he's fascinated with, Henry Ramos. Yeah. Um, and Art is his money supply, I think. Those are two main reasons. He kind of has to answer to him. They would often break up. They would get into big fights. There was a whole cycle right. that was going on. They would get into a fight. Mm-hmm. Um, Arthur would tell him to get lost, and Alan would say, you know, fuck you, I'm out of here. And Arthur right. would say, fine, get lost. And then Alan and then, would go off, run out of money, yep. come crawling back. Arthur would take him back yep. and start in his money train again and paying for anything he wanted. getting a job and supporting himself like a normal person was not an option for Alan. No. And not to mention, I mean, apparently this guy had like, other than managing the IHOP, he had no other skills. Mm-hmm. And he probably wouldn't have got that job if he, he wasn't had, dating Art. He had fake people skills. He's one of those people that was really good at being who you wanted him to be. He would walk into a room. People liked him. He's a him. chameleon. People liked him, but they knew yeah. that that wasn't really who he was, but they liked right. that version of whatever he was. He would show them attention. He would tell them what they want to hear, but it was all because of ulterior motives. He was one of those oh, guys. Absolutely. like People that later talked about Alan, they would say, you know, he was just an absolute compulsive liar. Mm-hmm. Like, it, what was there? Something about a rug or whatever? Like, That's right. There was a girl, Al, uh, her name was Anne, and she had a quote. She knew him at the time, yeah. Alan, and she said that if everybody in, in Miami got a piece of rug every time Alan told a lie, nobody would need to buy any rugs. What a garbage phrase. Yeah. That's a terrible slogan. That nobody is, says that. That is bad. That's the best you could come up with. I'm glad I didn't write that one. Right? If everybody got a piece of a rug, what? I, be, I bet she's what? reading that when the book came out going, damn it, that's the best I could do? Right, seriously. <laughs> I should have really thought about that. If everybody got a cigarette every time he told a lie, you'd all have cancer. You know... <laughs> What? Right. Huh? <laughs> what? But basically, he was well-known as a liar, but people still liked him because he was very personable. His fake yeah. personality was likable, I guess. Of course, because it's what you wanted. We've it's all met you people wanted like that, person. where you're like, okay, you're you're good at giving me what I want to see or telling me what I want to hear. Yeah. And good, being a good fake friend, it's awesome. Right. That's like how said, he He's a chameleon, man. He just yeah. blends into the surroundings. And, and he thought he was the smartest guy in the room. He thought he could convince everybody that oh, that's who sure. he really was, but everyone knew that wasn't who he really was, you know? Right. We've met people like this. He was a good manipulator, though, apparently. 
He was. He got what he wanted. D fell life. for it. She was one of the gold. Everybody awards. fell for it. She, no. Art was falling for it constantly. I think D was one of the few people that it, by the time she found out, okay, he's really playing me, it was too late. Whereas most people, yeah. like, they felt it right away. They could sense that he was playing them. Mm -hmm. Like, even D's daughter would go on to say, like, look, this guy is obviously playing you. But these And but, D just didn't want to believe it. She wanted to believe that she, he actually liked her and they but, were good friends and yada yada. But D's daughter, Susan, was on the outside, man. You gotta, you gotta but she saw it like for that. what it was. That's yeah, from the of... outside, it's easier to see there. I mean, think about your friend when he's in like a terrible relationship. You're like, dude, yeah, drop her, man. She's right, terrible right, right. for you, but he can't see it. He's yeah. on the inside. Yeah, that's true. It's just the same situation. It yeah. doesn't. It, it's the same thing with re with any kind of relationship, whether it's a friendship or, you know, a romantic relationship. It's still it's still hard to see when someone's someone that you care about is taking advantage of you. It's hard to see. Right. So D would approach Mike and ask him about this. You know, they would have this awkward conversation where he's like, "Yeah, totally, totally would kill people." She's like, "No, seriously, like, no, yeah. there's he's a guy. Like, no, really, how much? <laughs> yeah. There's a guy I know who wants someone killed. Seriously, do you know anybody?" And he's like, "Yeah, I got a guy. I got a guy for that. Yeah, I got a guy named Wild Bill, which is the perfect, <laughs> the perfect name for an assassin." Mike had a friend by the name of William Bill Rhodes, known by uh, his friends as Wild Bill because he was a Wild guy, I guess. He was also nicknamed the Joker. Yeah, he had a bunch of nicknames. Yeah. Wild Bill and the Joker. That's a, that's a kind of guy that'll kill someone for you. It sounds like it. Yeah. He was a, a small but muscular man. He had served four years in the Air Force and also served some time in prison for burglary. Hmm. And so this was Mike's hookup. So he uh, did the military minimum. I hear you. Right. <laughs> um, they basically established a contract. and But see, the whole thing is like D for the longest time. Maybe this is her side of it. Mm -hmm. She's like, I didn't believe it was really going to happen. Most I, of this is her side of it. Yeah. Yeah, according to her, she's like, none of this seemed real to her. It's, it almost seemed like the words that were coming out of her mouth trying to contract a hit on somebody were like... It sounds is, crazy. Yeah, and, and Mike, her buddy Mike, is like this gullible teddy bear guy where right. it's like she still thinks that he he's joking when he yeah. says he's actually going to do this and then he knows a guy and yada. She still thinks this whole thing is just a joke. And I think in her mind, she she like you said, she knew she was going to fail, but she could still go back to Alan and be like, well, I tried for you. Exactly. I, I went the extra mile for you. Yeah. You know, it didn't work out, but hey. Right, and then it works out. <laughs> at the worst, at the worst, she thought maybe that uh, Mike and and Wild Bill were just going to rip off Alan and take the money yeah. for the contract and not actually do anything. Right, and she, that, that that was like what she think maybe. Which they, for a split second they may have been thinking that. Right. <laughs> so they they basically established a contract for the hit. Um, basically, half the money would be put up front, and it was going to be twenty five hundred dollars total, twelve fifty up front, and then twelve fifty after the job was done. Um, Alan during this time stole sixteen hundred dollars from the IHOP to pay Mike for the first half of the killing. Right, and, and his other half was just a normal allowance. He was stealing like four hundred dollars a day, <laughs> on average. It's a lot of pancake money, man. Four hundred dollars a day. I'm surprised IHOPs do that well. well. I guess they're always packed. Even in Vegas, they're all, IHOPs are always packed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially in the mornings. Yeah. Because people come from out of town, they want something familiar, and then you know you don't want to worry about. You know, it's IHOP. I'm a, crack, I'm a Cracker thing. Barrel guy. If I'm going to choose between oh, yeah. the two, Cracker, Cracker Barrel's Barrel. bomb, right? It is. It's the shit. I mean, there's obviously like some small places you could go in town, like Stacks and Yolks, some really good yeah. breakfast places. But like, if you just want like your I traditional. I like the Waffle House if I'm eating breakfast for dinner. Yeah. Like if I'm just out late somewhere. Like when I was with my band or whatever, I would like, after the gig, I'd go to a Waffle House, just sitting there by myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good place for that, I think. Okay. You think so? I think so, but I don't okay. know where we're going. We're going way, way places. So the front upfront money is paid. The twelve fifty is paid. Um, Alan decided to kill Art himself at this point. Alan was that type of guy where he's like, "Well, why would we pay them? Now that I'm thinking about it, why would we pay those, these guys to do it? We could just do it ourselves." So he goes to right. D, and that way I can keep this whole sixteen hundred. <laughs> right. He goes to D and says, "Look, we're gonna." Uh, he picks her up again, takes her for another cruise. She doesn't know where they're going. Yeah. He takes her to a gun store and and says and convinces her to go in and buy a gun. Well, he goes in with the supposed intention of buying. Oh, the I gun. forgot my wallet. Oh, I forgot my wallet. Jeez. We need ID to buy a gun these days. Playing her like a fiddle the yep. whole time, like literally. Didn't put his ass on the line at all. As far as like no. on paper, you could look and go like, "This is all D. She paid the guys. She." Brought yep. in the guys to kill him. She buys a gun. She set up the whole thing. Right. Alan is just playing her like a puppet, like a puppet master. Here's something crazy. Maybe she fucking did. Maybe, yeah. Maybe she did. Maybe this was all the, her. The book that we are listening to is from mostly her point of view. Yeah. Maybe she did because she had a lot to gain from this. She was she she knew Alan would let her drink at work. Mm -hmm. Alan was going to give her a preferred shift, mm -hmm. and she was going to make more money. Yeah. 
I mean, there's a lot to benefit from this for right. her. Right. So. So she, he convinces her, or maybe she does this on her own accord, gets mm-hmm. a gun. It, one way or another, a gun gets a purchased, and the two of them, Alan and uh, and Dee, are going to go to Art's house. They know he goes to bed at like 11, and he yeah. lives in this property we talked about with all the trees. The house is tucked away back in there. It's totally, like, yeah. totally well, secluded, like quiet. Yeah, and also Alan told her that Art basically drinks himself to sleep every night. Yeah. That was the, that was the idea. Of yeah. going after 11. Apparently, he was an alcoholic, too, but was able to keep it under wraps for most of the day. Oh, is there anyone who's not an alcoholic in this story? Um, this author hates alcoholics, I'm pretty sure. This guy. You think he just provoked. made everyone in the book an alcoholic? I, dude, it really feels like it. He's just like, he's really dwelling on some vices. I'm like, dude, ease up, bro. Right. Like, what have you... <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Why are you judging so hard? This, this is like a guy that probably doesn't use Listerine, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. Right. So they go, they go to uh, Art's house late one night uh, with the intentions of just taking care of this themselves. Um, but of course, Alan, it's not in his, it's not in his DNA. He's not the hardcore mm-hmm. stone face killer. killer. He backs out of it, goes into the house. I think they even get into an argument. Maybe, Alan, maybe Art's like, "What's with the gun?" Type of thing. Yeah. They get an argument. <laughs> Alan leaves, and that's that's that. Yeah, um, why are you pointing a gun at me? <laughs> yeah, um, I think they got in an argument about the sixteen hundred dollars that had gone missing. Right? They did. Yeah. This yeah, this was a big argument actually. Yeah, we're kind of glossing over this, but this is one where they got into a fight. Mm-hmm. Art was pretty bad off. Art was hurt pretty. Was I mean he had some pretty bad injuries and cuts on his face and everything else. And then Alan tried to commit suicide. Yeah, didn't he like lock himself in the bathroom? Locked himself in the bathroom and just started swallowing pills. They had to pump his stomach. This wasn't the same he night that they the went hospital. to kill. That they went to kill him. They backed out and then this was shortly thereafter. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So he ends up in the hospital. Um, Art had found out about the missing $1,600. Um, Alan told Art at this point that he had loaned the $1,600 to D through yeah. her, through his friend under the bus after he's totally setting her up yeah. to, for the murder thing. And then he basically lies and says that he'd lent her the money. Um, at which point Art goes to D and confronts her about $1,600 yeah. that, that uh, Alan had supposedly lent it to her. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? Yeah, and he was like, you didn't take the money? You don't need a divorce? She's like, well, I need a divorce, but I didn't take the money. <laughs> right. And Art goes, well, you know, Alan is a liar, so I guess I believe you because he lies yeah. about everything. Right. But I'm going to keep giving him money and cars and jobs. Right. <laughs> now, D at this point thinks, okay, this whole contract thing, the whole killing thing, this is this this is all blown up, freaking. Right. Let's just forget about it. Alan's in the hospital. You know, Art's confronting me about money and this and that. So she calls Mike and says, Look, cancel the contract. It's all done. They were supposed to have already done According it. According to her. They were supposed to have already done it. They yes. had gone and also backed out. Yep. Fucking Wild Bill wasn't as wild uh, as we thought. No, he, he went, wasn't. More like Tame Bill, am I right? <laughs> right. Good one. Uh, Nudge with the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> am I right? Or like Broken Bill. Right. So they had put it off for another week. They were going to yeah. do it the following week. But when they got the call from D saying it's off, they just say, okay, well, I guess we're pocketing this 1250 bucks and uh, got a free payday. Right. No refunds, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, what are they going to do? Yeah, but Alan, uh, once he checks himself out of the hospital, he goes back to D and says, "Look, this. Uh, did you kill him yet? Yeah, is Arthur <laughs> is Arthur dead? Because he's, uh, <laughs> he's still wearing like the onesie. His ass is showing out the back. Is he dead yet? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the way it sounded in the book. He jumps out of the Lincoln. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, he he goes to D and D's kind of like shocked. Like, what are you talking about? Like, no, we're not killing him. Like, this whole thing blew up. You're in the hospital. Like, you still want him to be killed? And he's like, Yes, I want him dead more than ever. Right. I thought, we, what's with the money? And so they end up establishing another new contract, at which point uh, there was be a deposit of $2,500 and another $2,500 where the job was done. So they got yeah. the free twelve fifty. and now they want double the money for this next one. Yeah. I mean, who kills somebody for twelve fifty? Even in the 80s, that's not a whole lot of money to be <laughs> putting your the rest of your life at stake no. to get locked up for. And I think that's part of what made D feel like this can't be real. Who's yeah. going to kill somebody for $2,500 total? Right. I mean, even five thousand. Mike and Wild Bill. I mean, Ross Ulbricht was was shelling out a hundred grand a body, right? <laughs> and it didn't even happen. Well, that was Bitcoin dollars, bro. <laughs> it, <I know. laughs> I'm pretty sure the uh, we all know digital money's fake. The ratio was made. All right, there. Uh, Mike and Bill inst- insisted that Alan go with them this time, though. So they're mm-hmm. going, okay, we're going to do this one. We're going to really do it, but you're coming yeah. with us. 
Well, that, that was kind of stupid for them to roll up on the house with no insight. They don't know if he has any animals. And he did have a Doberman. Mm -hmm. Art had a Doberman. Didn't know if he had any animals. How are they going to get in the house? What are they going to do, break in? Then that makes more noise. Right. Like when you have access to the house. Yeah. That was kind of stupid. Let's just have uh, Alan go with us. That's and probably just... more likely what happened. Yeah. They probably rolled up and were like, wait, we're totally not prepared for this. Right. <laughs> we can we just make this, uh, this little fucker go with us and open the door with yeah. his key. And we'll just charge him again. Right. For our gas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so the night of the murder, Mike and Bill pick up uh, Alan at IHOP, and they headed off to Art's house. Dee stayed at the restaurant. Um, the truth about what happened that night, though, is is kind of it's up to who you talk to. They all have different stories. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go through each person's stories, or do you want to tell the let's tell the official like police held in the courtroom type story first? Okay. The the commonly believed what actually happened that night. Okay. Okay. So Art's laying in bed. Art's laying in bed. Pitch black in his house apparently doesn't believe in any sort of night lights. <sighs> what a rookie mistake, right? <laughs> so he hears he hears a car pull up, mm -hmm. two doors shut. So two if people initially he's figuring it's Al in his home. Right. But then he hears the other door and mm -hmm. he's like, okay. He's like, the nerve of this son of a bitch brought his lover into my house. Mm -hmm. That's what he's thinking. So he's sitting there and he's like pissed off. And then he hears them come in the door or whatever, no talking, no nothing. Here's the footsteps. I guess he's just laying there wide awake at midnight or whatever when they got there. And um, then he sees a dark figure in the doorway, and he's just standing there. And I guess it was to let his eyes adjust. That's that's the description they gave in the yeah. book. So he's just standing there. And this and was Bill that was standing in the doorway. Exactly. Wild Bill. Bill. And so he slowly approaches the bed or whatever, and Art's like yelling, like, who are you? What do you want? You know, take mm -hmm. what you want. A whatever. scuffle ensues. Yeah. A scuffle ensues. Art ends up on the floor or whatever. And um, somewhere it's, in there, Wild Bill gets the razor to the throat and slits his throat, right? I mean, there's well, not a whole lot that you can tell for sure there. But then didn't you hear the version where uh, Mike came in to hold him while Wild Bill slit his throat? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because Wild Bill is a smaller guy, and right, actually right. Arthur was giving him a hard time. Yeah. And so he calls Mike in from the living room into the bedroom to help him, where yeah. Mike, being a bigger guy, grabs Arthur, holds him there while Wild Bill slits his throat with right. this razor that he always had. Right. So and supposedly then they would both have take part in the murder. The one thing about that book is it was so eerie the way that that was told. It was told from Arthur's perspective. It was like, you're Arthur, uh, what was his last name? Venetia. You're Arthur Venetia. You're laying in bed one night. Uh, you know, you hear a car it's pulling. It's eerie, and it's also... Just for the effect, because at the end... No, I like the way it was done. I, it, it was, yeah, it but, definitely... But like, he obviously added things, though. Oh, there's no, no there's doubt. There's things he you're couldn't putting have word, known. You're putting words in the mouth of a dead man. You don't yeah. know what was going through his head at the time, but right. the book in, insinuated that it did know what was going through his mind. But it was still eerie, like, yeah, who is this man that is scuffling with me? Who is this? Right. And now there's another man that comes in. He's holding you, and there's a knife to my throat, and now I'm, I feel a sharp pain in my throat. Yeah. And, I'm gasping for air. I yeah. can't get any. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. the last, the last thing intense. I thought, Alan did this to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how did you know what he thought? You just, no. Yeah. Alan did that this That sometimes to me. drives me nuts about books in that they put words into people's mouths and you're like, yeah, you well, don't know. Well, it's no different what, than a movie. Yeah. Over-exaggerating, over-dramatizing everything. Yeah. It's the same thing. you got to sell books, man. Based on true events. Right. Yeah. Well, this is supposed to be a little more based in, on true events well, than Well, either way, movie. what happened was, that night was the three men went to the house and Arthur ends up with a slit throat. Apparently, and, Alan and stayed dead. in the car, by the way. Yeah. Well, either way, the three of them are involved. They're there. Yeah. yeah. Arthur is dead. No, I'm He's, saying because we there was only two car slams supposedly. Yeah. But I mean, whose account is that? You know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the only the guy, dead guy. The, the only guy that's not biased on this in this whole scenario is the dead guy. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's fishy. Either way, Arthur ends up dead on his floor, laying on his bed sheets after the scuffle. So there was definitely some kind of a scuffle that ensued because right. he ended up dead on the floor, uh, wrapped in his bed sheets, kind of. Yeah. And uh, the deed is done, and when Bill returns and tells Dee that it's been done, and also when Alan tells Dee that it's been done, she actually can't believe that it actually happened. Right. She's freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> to say the least. It's like, you know, what did you think was going to happen? Like, you, you think you're going to go this far with something, and all these people are just going to play a trade with you? This isn't, it's like, you know, Ashton Kusher's not going to show up and go, you've been punked. Like, you've been, yeah. this is real. You've paid, you've paid people to kill someone. Yeah. You're involved. And what's funny is near the end, she still thought she would just be in, like she got she was going to get some small criminal charge, not murder. Like when you're that deeply involved in a murder, you're getting right, murder right. charges. Yeah. 
You played you a think, direct role in it. So it's not conspiracy, you don't think, to commit murder? Well, no, because she's the hookup. And then a lot of people, a lot of people on the outside of this case that they dealt with, like um, the gun broker people that bought property from them later on and things, they all testified that it seemed like D was in control. Yeah. Which is which is the opposite of what the author portrays. Although, if you, uh, I have a question. If, if... D, if if D wasn't involved in this, I still say Alan ends up killing Arthur one way or another, whether he hires someone or he does it himself. Mm-hmm. I think it was inevitable. It was going to happen. Yeah. I think Alan was a ticking time bomb. Oh, he was yes. a dude that was completely out of control, and there was yeah. no way he was just going to stay with Arthur happily ever after. He saw how much money and all this stuff that he right. wanted that Alan had, and he didn't want to be with Alan. He wasn't happy with Alan. No, D did not seal their I mean, fate. Arthur. No, it's not. You can't put it all on D for sure. D wouldn't have killed he someone was, with a warrant for Alan. And Alan would have ended up killing not Arthur only, one way or another. Not only this, Alan knew a shit ton of Cuban criminals. Yeah. I'm telling you, yeah. It would have been one of his yeah. little boyfriends from Cuba or somebody would have ended up killing Arthur. Right. It is unfortunate that Dee met him and got sucked into this. It is unfortunate for her. Right. Because a lot of the money that, that uh, Alan was taking from IHOP was to spend it on these on these guys. Mm-hmm. Like, he was, he was really treating these dudes. Yeah. Like, he would have multiple guys over... <laughs> At even at Art's house, when yeah. he was at work and stuff, or off on business, and yeah, he would treat these people. So he was he had a lifestyle yep. that he had to support. And yeah, you're right. If D wasn't in the picture, nothing nothing would stand in his way. I don't think at this point. No, nope. yeah. he was going to end up taking more and more money from the IHOP. At which point, corporate was going to step in because they wouldn't get get their cut, which ends up happening. Right. Alan was he just he was a guy that always more 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 yep. to the point where it was like it's it's. It, you're like heading on a roller coaster that has no end to it. You know, you're heading off a cliff. Like you're Thelma and Louise driving towards a cliff, but he's just gunning it like full speed until you hit the wall type of thing. Like keep spending until there's no more left. And that's what happens after Arthur ends yep. up dying. He's taking his all of his property after he wipes out his bank account. Yeah. Arthur had like 33 grand in some account. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is where the conspiracy starts coming in with Alan. He's calling up, acting as though he is Arthur. Yeah, or his power of attorney. Calling for checks to be sent yeah. to him, basically wiping out his savings accounts. And then once that's dried up, he's using it on cocaine. He's treating everyone at the IHOP to dinners. Yep. Extravagant. Everybody at the at the IHOP's doing coke with Alan after this, except for D, because she's against drugs. She just likes alcohol. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But he's a, he's just he's a guy that's he, always seems to head towards he's going to hit rock bottom at some point. Mm-hmm. And it's just he's like full speed until I hit that. You know, he yep. he immediately does. And once he runs out of the money, he dries up Arthur's accounts. He starts turning to all of his property to sell, yeah. and then we have to start bringing in the the second murder in this whole thing. Yeah, there was another there was another loose end that had to be tied up yes. before before this could all happen. Yep. Uh, Arthur had an old mother who was what eighty four years old who lived on the property in a trailer. Yeah, she lived like just feet from the house. <laughs> yeah, and so. Arthur wouldn't let her in, which is kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of messed up. Yeah. Well, she wasn't too excited about his lifestyle, so yeah, you know true. what was he supposed She's to old do? Old school. Yeah. Yeah, she wanted him to have a nice girl and be married, and he was obviously a homosexual, so that wasn't going to happen. Right. But he did, you know, she was fairly happy out there in her trailer on the property, and, he, and Arthur took good care of her, and she loved her son mm-hmm. more than anything. He was all she had. Yeah. Um, this is a woman named Bessie. Right. Who lived on the, on the trailer out there. And, of course, once Arthur's dead, it's a ticking time bomb before yes. Bryant has so real to get quick, rid of let's, her. Yeah, because let's let's tell them what they did with the body, with yeah. Art's body. So Dee and Alan go back the <laughs> next much. day to clean up, right? So they yeah. clean up the house. They this clean is where up she realized, floor. holy shit, they actually did it. Right. And then they end up taking his body out to the garage and putting him in an old wardrobe. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what this is. I, don't know what the plan I, I, I is. picture like a, a big wooden it, box. Thing. No, I mean I know what a wardrobe is, but okay. I don't know where they're how they're thinking this is going to work. They out. They didn't think it through. They just not didn't. at all. They're like, let's just just put them in the garage. Yeah, let's put them in the garage with the with the with the skis. Right. With the <laughs> <laughs> next <laughs> to those paint cans over there. Put them in there next to that mountain bike I never ride. Right. Like yeah, I mean like why did he? Why did they do that? But anyways, they, um, at first they were like they had the right idea. Like we need to throw uh, Alan was like we need to take him to another state. He wanted to take him to North Carolina and like throw him in a uh, on his old pro he had a uh, Alan or I mean, yeah. Arthur had a property in North Carolina right. and they wanted to take him there. That's still dumb though. Like you don't Well, they were doing they were doing some kind of like random produce checks or something like with mm-hmm. people leaving 
out of Florida, like they would do random stops and just check, make sure you weren't taking like a whole bunch of produce and stuff across the border. Oh, okay. So there was, they could be randomly selected for no reason. But take him anywhere but the property that you killed him at, that he lives at. In my opinion, like throw him in his body, uh, like a body of water, a river, any something. Yeah. Well, the thing is, they had no, they had no ties to the crime, even 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 still. They're, what are you they're, talking about? He's dating the guy. That doesn't matter. They can't tie him to the murder right now at all. They can't tie him to it. There's not enough evidence at this point. It's still it's still an it's still a good crime right now at this point. I would say it's if still there's a, one person that has motive to kill Arthur, it is Alan. Yeah, motive, his young boyfriend who is dating other men and everyone knows is a pathological liar. Right. Well, motive is all is all well and great, dude, but it's not enough to convict for murder. Except that he's at the scene of the crime, trouncing through blood all over the floor and everything, and um, I'm sure doesn't he was know wearing the gloves, and then they burn their clothes. Doesn't know the whereabouts of his lover. That's 101 cleaning up a body. He has been taking money from the business that Arthur owns, and now he's calling up and getting checks for the money that dude, Ar- You know how our Arthur's legal system accounts. is. That is not enough. That's right. not enough. If, they, if, if they don't have a weapon, if they don't have his fingerprints on the weapon, it is amazing Arthur's to Arthur's blood on the other side. It is amazing to me that even to this day, if you look into this, you look at articles about this story, it's like police said after catching uh, Alan and uh, D that it was the perfect crime until yeah. friends spoke up. It's like, how is this the perfect crime? This seems so stupid it to me. It seems so sloppy. It, it does. seems so fucking sloppy. But it was it was only a perfect crime because of how long they got away with it and the bodies had decayed enough. It was only a perfect crime because Arthur was a loner. That's the only reason it was a perfect crime. The yep. only person and where he, really, he lived. Yeah, his he, house played even, against him. Even the IHOP which he owned, he showed up rarely too, and it was just to do some accounting. He would go in the back room, yeah, you know, account for the finances and whatnot, see how much money Alan had been taking from the fucking thing, try right. and, try and figure that out, and that was it. He was a guy that didn't he he just kind of kept to himself and that's the way he liked it. His, his, the most contact he had was with his 84 year old mother who was now senile and right. really didn't know what was going on half the time. Mm-hmm. And so that was why it was the perfect crime is right. if you whacked one of us, like the way that they did this sloppy like yeah. that, you'd be caught immediately. People would right. be like, where's Lauren? Where's Michael? Right. But this older. Cause we see people every single day. Right. That are expecting to see us. So no one called, no one started calling for Arthur. It took months before anyone even really started like, where the hell is this guy? They basically right. just said, Arthur went to North Carolina. Yeah. Cause he had some property up there. So they said that he went up there to kind of spend time at that property and invest and maybe and dry out too. They yeah. said that he was having alcohol problems or whatever. I mm-hmm. don't know if that was shit was added from the author or what, but so he, he's in the shed. I mean, he's in the garage, but yeah. they ended up moving him to a shed on the property because the garage was right, was even closer to the trailer that his mother lived in right. than the house. So they moved him, you know, to the other side of the property into a building, and he stayed there for a while, yeah. supposedly. And this time, the, um, Alan is trying to convince Dee to tie up this loose end. He's like, we got to off Bessie. And like, Dee is so to. against it. She's like... I'll do anything to, you know, we don't need to make this worse and kill more people. That's not what I've intended for this whole thing to be at and just getting out right. of hand. I will take her. At this time, she's kind of like assistant manager or something of the IHOP, right? Mm-hmm. She's kind of like running it really because obviously yeah. Alan is not running it. He's too busy doing coke. and Alan just got promoted. He's owner now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so she's running the IHOP. So she says, I'll take her food from the IHOP morning and night. I'll feed Bessie. Yep. I'll give her attention and I'll tell her her son has gone to North Carolina for a while. Yep. And she's senile. She's not even going to know this how long he's been weeks. gone. Well, Bessie doesn't know whether he's been gone for two days, two weeks. Exactly. She's confused. Yep. And she's so she there. keeps saying, I miss my son. When is he going to call? But then, you know, Dee just goes, oh, he just left a couple days ago and she's keeping her at bay. Yeah, nothing to worry about. Right. And, and she starts to get attached to Bessie. And so she she's does. really against the whole idea of killing this poor innocent old woman, right? And whose son's already been killed. Years old, like, yeah. And then, and but, she's trying to convince Alan, like, look, she might die on her own soon. She's old, you know. Yeah. And Alan is just, you know, like we said, he's just this guy is just so hateable you to me. What? I can't stand him. You know what though? We're not thinking back. I don't think they were worried about Bessie finding the body. I think they were worried about somebody visiting Bessie and finding the body. I think Alan just he was a she was a nuisance to him. He wanted to hang out at the property. He didn't want to have to think about her. He's just, it's easier just to say the word, have, give Mike a couple grand out of the cash register and have her taken care of because he was heartless. I just, mm-hmm. I think that's all it was. He was. I don't think he was truly worried about her saying anything to get him caught. I think it was just. He just didn't want her around. Yeah. It was, she was a minor inconvenience to him and he just wanted her gone to not wow. have to think about it. You really painting him as a selfish son of a bitch. That's what he was. He was. I agree. By far the most hateable person in this story. 
Yeah. I would rather hang out with Wild Bill any day than Alan. Hell yeah. He's probably got some kick-ass stories. Right. Oh, Wild Bill. Just don't let anybody give him a couple hundred bucks to kill you because he'll do yeah. it. And make sure he ain't got his razor with him. <laughs> Bill, check in your razor at the door, please. <laughs> check in the basket. <laughs> right. Right. So, so eventually, Alan would keep pestering and pestering. And one night they would go, him and uh, Dee would go out to a dinner on his dime. Mm-hmm. And he would get her nice and drunk. And he would basically seduce her into the idea of finally paying Bill and uh, Mike to off Bessie. That's right. Much to her chagrin, she would finally agree to let it happen. Not and only did he convince her to do it, he convinced her to orchestrate the entire thing. Yeah. He had he had God, no... he was such a puppet master, man. He yeah. knew he knew she was an alcoholic and he knew that she was she at this point she's fully like accepted that she oh, wants man. him. Like yeah. she is like dreaming about uh, having sex with him. Right. She like, mentioned that she would do things just to get him to touch her. Yeah. Like she yeah, she was head over heels. And right he knows now. it, so he's using yeah. that to his advantage and Basically, she finally agrees to it. She talks to Mike. They got the the payment again. Once again, I think this time it's twenty five hundred bucks to kill the old lady. Yep. Uh, Twelve fifty up front again. Yep. Uh, right away, Alan gives the money, and the way it's going to work is that D was going to go to the trailer, uh, feed Bessie, hang out with her for a little while, and then she was going to tell Bessie, "Look, there's going to be a couple guys coming over to fix the roof. You got a leaky roof in your trailer." Yeah. Um, we're going to have a couple guys come over to uh, maintenance men to fix it for you. And Bessie, of course, at first is against the idea. I don't want anybody in my trailer. I don't know these, right. that I don't know. And she rightfully so. Yeah, smart old lady. Yeah. Maybe not as senile as they played it to be. Right. And and D, she trusted D, though. She liked D. She yeah. believed D was a good person. She liked Gosh. to hear D talk about her sons. And she, you know, yeah, started to care about D. And D cared about her. And anyways, such a, this will be such a sad scene if it was a movie, right? Like D just leaving the trailer that day, knowing, knowing that, two, that it's the last time she's going to see her. Yeah. And the I mean, two heartless bastards are coming over and they tried D pleaded with Mike. She said, look, just make it please painless and make it quick and painless. I, I like this older lady and she's innocent. She didn't do yeah. anything wrong. Just please. And Mike's like, I promise. <laughs> Mike actually told her that Bill knew was a karate expert and he could do a karate chop to the back of her neck and she would die <laughs> yeah. immediately. Yeah, that's an awesome power. Pressure point, bro. Judo chop. <laughs> <laughs> Judo chop. Judo chop. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty dark joke there. <laughs> knowing that they did kill the old lady, but... Sorry. But not judo chop style, so... No, they strangled her, which... It would be better if he did actually know how to do a karate chop of death in one, one swoop. Right. No one can do that shit. All this pressure point crap, it's garbage. <laughs> it's <laughs> Put one of these, You're going to have somebody right in. <laughs> put one of these pressure point guys in a cage with freaking Luke Rockhold right now and see what happens. It's not going to go well. Who he knows pressure points, Lauren? Yeah. One hit, he's done. Wild Bill pressure points. Oh, that's right. I picture the, the guy in Napoleon Dynamite. You think I'm a loser because I go home to Yolanda every night? <laughs> Bow to your sensei. Right. Like you get to wear these pants just for nothing? <laughs> right. Exactly. So she basically convinces Bessie that, you know, there's going to be a couple guys come by. She leaves. She leaves the trailer unlocked, and it's all set up. Bill and Mike show up to the trailer. They go in. Bessie's unsure at first, of course, and it's up in the air. Uh, the The actual story is that Bill strangled her with some kind of a scarf or something that they yeah. found in the trailer, the right? Yeah, hose, I think. But it's also widely believed that maybe Mike did it just to get even because he – Wanted to prove himself. Yeah, because Bill killed Arthur, and right. so maybe Mike wanted to prove to Bill that he could kill too. Yeah, you can kill an 84-year-old lady. Hmm, tough guy. Either way, the two of them went in there, Yeah, and old Bessie ends up dead, Yeah, and they're both responsible regardless of who actually you know. Right, and of course her. they both blame each other. Yeah, I love how they... <laughs> and they were supposed to bury her. Bill... That was part of the deal. That was part of yeah, the payment, they and they just left her sitting at the kitchen table in her trailer, yeah. slumped over. And yeah. so when Dee finds out that she's still in the trailer, she wanted she wanted nothing to do with this. She cared for this lady, so when she goes back with with Alan and and sees the body, she is she is irate at, oh, yeah. at at Mike because she liked Mike and trusted him, and he did this to her. Right. And also the jewelry out of the trailer, she had a lot of valuable jewelry. Yeah. And they swiped that, of course, but it's probably for the best because Alan was going to get it anyway and blow oh, that shit yeah. too. Yeah. It's but, best that they're spending it on whatever they're spending. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's all the same, dude. There's yeah. So nobody, this, nobody, nobody seems like a good person through and through in this story, man. These people no. that are involved. Yeah, there's just, really no one that you can root for in this, this whole story. Nobody that lives. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's rough. There's a lot of blame going around. Everybody's blaming each other. Yeah. So they, so they have to clean up the crime scene now. They got two bodies at this property. 
Yeah. So they they call this this local uh, backhoe operator so stupid, remember. dude. It's so, they're to just dig so a dumb. Hole. Yeah. It's it's just, like, here's what's crazy, right? So he digs this hole that's big enough for two bodies or whatever. It's like 18 by 18 feet. Yeah, it's, it's a like big ass hole. They it's dig. huge because they say they're going to put trash. And in the it. property has some kind of a rock that's super hard to get through. Yeah, they were going to dig the hole themselves, and they're like, "Oh, screw this." Yeah, I'm a 44. Yeah, right. I'm a 44 year old woman. You're a 26 year old effeminate yeah. man. You're not. Gonna... Alan probably hasn't worked a day in his life, right. anyways. So. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think you would have gotten like some of his Cuban boyfriends to dig it, but like we said, there was like some like crazy rock on this property that you yeah, couldn't quartz. get through. Yeah, right? quartz, quartz. Yeah, even the right. backhoe operator said that some of his equipment was broken trying to dig. Yeah, through he his broke property. a piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah, so he digs the hole, and they tell him, "Yeah, it's going to be for trash, or whatever." So they finally, after he gets done digging the hole, they finally throw the wardrobe in there with Art's body in it, and mm -hmm. and also Bessie. But here's what's crazy, right? So the date on the invoice of when the man dug the hole was only four days after Art's murder. Yeah. That's weird. Mm -hmm. Because in their timeline, in Dee's timeline, they had the hole dug after both were killed. Yeah. And yet Bessie was alive for weeks after Art. Yeah. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Ultimately, they killed Arthur. They left his body in the garage. Whether no, it's but, it, but here's the thing. Like, why, why not go ahead and put Arthur in the hole? Right. It, were you just lazy, or were you planning to kill Bessie from day one? They were planning to kill Bessie. At yeah. least Arthur. Alan was. Alan was planning to kill Bessie all along, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. So they end up throwing their bodies in there. The he, knew were, eventually, they, he, he knew eventually. He knew he could eventually convince D to do it. You know, he knew it was a matter yeah. of time. He just had to well, get her drunk he enough, he would do it. enough. Yeah. He would do it, and then what's D going to say? What's D going to do, tell on him? Right. Yeah, she can't. Exactly. So they throw their bodies in there. They throw a bunch of trash on top of it. And then they call the backhoe operator again to push the dirt back in there. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable to me that they got away with it as long as they did, yeah. as dumb as they were, honestly. Yeah. And and this whole time, Alan is 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 assuming Arthur's uh, identity. identity. He's mm -hmm. using his – he's he's already swiped. He's ran through that 33 grand in yep. like a month. I, I forget the timeline as far as he ran through that money fast. Very. Fast. He kept going. He would call up. The uh, the account and he would say, okay, I'm Arthur. Can you send me a check for six thousand dollars? Blow yep. through that. Call up again. Can you send me a check for seven thousand dollars? Yep. Before you know it, he had called up so many times that thirty three grand was down to like a hundred bucks. Didn't he cash a check for like fifty cents under Arthur's name? It was unreal. This yeah. dude was just anything. Ran through that money. Then started selling everything he owned. His boat. He had like an old organ. Yep. From like a from like a church. You know, like full like pipe organ and all that mm -hmm. stuff. He's having people come from other states to buy stuff from yeah. the property, and he's assuming Arthur's name. He sold he sold Bessie's trailer. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He was selling everything on the property and eventually sold the property. Yeah. And that man, he, he sold. I'm he, actually amazed that they were able to pull that off, you know, without Arthur. Because of that lawyer. Yeah. That they, they had dealt a dirty with. lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. They had a dirty lawyer that they were dealing with who took Alan at his word that he was Art. Mm -hmm. And then he called him in to testify to the, I guess, the bank, the mortgage loan or officer, whoever, you know, was yeah. doing the deal between selling the house. And he was like, yeah, that's Art Venetia. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, well, that's going to have to work. Because right. Alan forgot his wallet again. Right. And he's selling all of this stuff at a premium, like, not all oh, super cheap. Super cheap. Yeah, not the guy, at a premium, that, the guy that bought the house was just stoked. He wasn't even thinking, like, why yeah. does this guy not have his ID? Ever? This is a five <laughs> acre property, and Alan only sold it for, what, like 130 grand or something? Yes. I mean, even in the 80s, like, now I looked up the property, I looked up photos of it, I, I did some, it's like, commercial property now, stalking right? and research. To figure out what the address was, I looked it up, and overhead yeah. it's just filled with trees. But it's yeah. like f almost five acres, like four and a half acres. Nowadays, it's worth. I looked it up on Zillow; it's worth like three hundred seventy thousand well, dollars. Because there's there's more around it now that it's commercial. Yeah, no right? doubt, no doubt. I'm sure it's it's gone up a lot just the entire area. Because the civilization around that area, yeah. But still, even at the time, it was a bargain. That's why this the dude that bought the house didn't even care about seeing identity. He was like, I just I've got to get this place. He was starting a landscaping business, and he's like, for the price I'm getting it for, I don't care. I just want to get yeah. the deal done. And so he ended up getting screwed when it all hit the fan. And then, then you got the law enforcement digging up his property for these bodies. But we'll get to right. that. Right. So so what happens here is while Alan's doing all this, he's not splitting this money with D. Right. <laughs> None of this money is going with D, D, even though D is helping him orchestrate most of these deals. Because mm -hmm. she had a lot of financial knowledge. As far as mortgages, interest rates, all mm -hmm. that shit, like she was very familiar with that stuff. Dee's struggling for money because at her newer, higher up position at IHOP, she's not making the tips. Nope, and she's, she's working making, more hours. Working more hours, making less money, and then she's doing spending a lot of her free time helping Alan with the shit, and he's taking all of the profits. Yep, running around doing whatever. He and wants. she's finally starting to hear what her daughter Susan had been telling her, and that Alan is playing you. Yeah, she's finally starting to see that. Yep, 
So but she's so invested at this point. She's now in it for murder with him. She's conspired to do murder with him. So right. it's like... And I think this time she just gets worn down, man. She's in a depressed state. Yeah. She's just done. So she, she finally decides to confess all of this to a friend of hers. Yeah. Named Jackie Reagan. And tells her friend to write it down. Not tells only her to write it Write down. all of this down because if Alan kills me, I want this on the record. She's now convinced that Alan is going to whack her as well because she's like the final... One of the final links that could get him caught. Yep. Which is actually not bad thinking. Like the right the the book was like acting like she was crazy to think this. I'm like, fuck no, she's not. Like no. Alan just has people killed on a whim. He doesn't yeah, care. He doesn't care. He's living moment to moment. That dude would absolutely have her killed. This he guy, obviously didn't love her. He was just using her. A second that she's not useful anymore, he would kill yeah. her. Yeah. The only I, reason he kept her around is because she did all his work for her. I think his drug addiction him. was uh glossed over. Like he spent so much time on her alcohol on her alcoholism, but he was freaking. He was a coke addict. He yeah. was a cokehead and alcoholic. He spent. A he would shit buy her bottle, coke. He would buy her bottles of scotch, but himself a bottle of like vodka or right. something. And if you're doing coke and alcohol together, you can take do more of each because oh, they yeah. offset each other. So yeah, he's having these parties and just blowing ridiculous amounts of money on coke mm-hmm. and alcohol. It's like everybody blames it on D's alcoholism. Like the whole book, like D's on the cover. I'm like, why is D on the cover? Right. It makes no sense. This is all about Alan, right? This is Alan. It has to be, unless unless the shit unless D was. You know, according to the author, I would have put Alan on the cover. Right. If I mean, I just don't understand why he put D on the I cover. I think I'm not. I'm not marking D out like she couldn't have been the mastermind. Uh-huh. I'm just saying I don't know why. Listening to his perspective for ten hours, why he, I think Alan would have been caught a lot quicker because of the sloppiness. If it weren't for D's ability, she was very smart with numbers. She was the, she was the thing that got the house sold. Yeah, he would have ran yeah, out. Yeah. He would not have been able to make that house sold properly he would not have been able to assume arthur's identity and pull that off selling a house no if it weren't for d's expertise she was right. she would go into these meetings and she knew all the lingo yeah. with mortgage and all that stuff she was able to make a lot of these she was very smart very smart so especially they were a bad pairing in that sense that alan would have been caught a lot faster he was a loose cannon like we've talked about the entire time he right. been caught if it weren't for d he was using her but Ultimately, it was because she was infatuated with him. You know, if he would have just shared the profits with Dee and actually gained they her trust, made a hell of a parent, they could have made it. They could have right. made it out. Hell yeah. And made a shit ton of money if he just wouldn't have been so damn greedy. They could have been the next Bonnie and Clyde. They, yeah, but get away with it. Right. Yeah, but so she tells this friend, Jackie, about everything. Jackie yeah. writes it down, and then Jackie, of course, having to tell someone, tells a lady... By the name of the Ann, wrong lady. Ann Patano. The wrong lady. Who was a friend of Art's. A mutual friend of Art's was, and Jackie's. Was a friend. Was a friend of Art's. And then, like Alan does, he also burns bridges. And Yeah, he, she he, hated She hated Alan. Him. Because here's what happened. So, her and Alan always had a terrible relationship. They did not get along. They hated each other. So, when Art and Alan were on good terms, she would get fired from mm-hmm. IHOP. She was another waitress at IHOP. And then, when they would fight... And then he, Art would finally get tired of Alan's shit and kick him out. She, he would rehire Ann. Yeah. And then back and forth and back and forth. I'm like, what is Ann doing just waiting? Not just only plotting, that, trying not only to... that uh, the, the reason they hated each other from the get-go was because Ann had rented a house to Alan. And oh, Alan, that's right. That's and, right. And Alan didn't pay rent. Yeah. He paid the first month. And then every time she'd come back for rent, Alan would go, oh, I'll get you next week. Oh, I'll get you next week. I'll get yeah. you next And he never paid. Never and paid. that's why right off the bat, they had a bad relationship. And then she's working for him. And yeah. like you said, every time that uh, Alan would get booted from IHOP managing it, Arthur would bring her back. And then yeah. when, whenever they would you know, make up and, and uh, Alan would assume his role back at IHOP, she would right. get fired again. Yeah. <laughs> I can just see him opening the door when she comes to collect rent, freaking Coke boogers hanging from his nose and right. shit. Uh, I'll get you next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and by now, uh, Alan hadn't been – he'd been swiping so much money and the corporate – People like you know they have to pay their franchising fees right. and whatnot. Yeah, on top of selling all art stuff, he's still scapes, uh, you know scraping money off the top of the cash register. Yeah, so the the corporate heads over at IHOP are, are they haven't been paid for a long time, and D was able to subside that. At one point, she went and met with uh, the guy that's supposed to be paid and said, mm-hmm. "Look, I'll pay you," but then they're still not getting paid, and so right. they assume the uh, they take over the IHOP. Yep, and basically. Uh, Alan's D is, done. D Alan, is done. Yeah, D is fired. Her worst fears of being fired from her IHOP job yep. have now been realized. And this happened right before she she wrote the whole you know confession confession. Thing. That's, That's probably right. part of her downfall. She it always is. said that if she didn't have a job, she didn't have a purpose, and she could yeah. she didn't have a means to provide the alcohol that she needed right. to get through her days. So that was part of uh, her me- mental breakdown that she had and, yep. and confessed to her friend. And then her friend goes to Anne. Anne. That's right. Who now it's her mission to catch. 
the, yeah. say, the, she knows these two are murderers. She just has yep. to prove it. See, because before this, Anne was already snooping around the property. Yeah. She was already snooping around Art's house and you know, noticing that Betsy's trailer was gone, mm-hmm. that the plants were dying. This was all not... Stuff that Arthur would never allow yeah, to happen. Yeah, this was not characteristically of Art at all. Right. So, and then, so when she got this confession, and she was already, she was trying to get the police involved already. She kept calling this certain detective, mm-hmm. telling him, you know, you need to come check out this property. And, and he wasn't taking her serious until she got that confession. Right. When she got that confession from D. It was it was open can of worms from there. Right. Then the detective had to follow up on it. Yep. They went out to the property. They noticed some things that were weird. They noticed some stains in the garage yep. where the body had been stored. Right. That they by the time they at. finally come out there, though, the new owner has already moved in. Right. That's how long it took them from the time yeah. that all this happened. I mean, it took them a while before they finally sent a detective out there to yeah. follow up on this. They talk to the owner. They ask, yep. is there any uh, parts of the property that you notice they look like there's been some ground that's been overturned and like yep. moved around recently? And he says, yeah, in the southeast corner... There's, yep. a, there's a section that looks like that where they go to the back. They then go to the backhoe uh, operator <laughs> the guy. The same guy. The local. So he knows exactly one, where the hole is. There's probably one backhoe yeah, guy in this yeah, little town. Absolutely. And so they go to him, and he's like, yeah, I went to that property, and uh, I can show you you know, where it's at. And yep. they end up – and then all the pieces start crumbling. They start talking to all the guys that uh, Alan sold property of Arthur's to. Yeah. And they start going uh, – they show pictures of uh, Arthur to the people that bought the property, and they're like, no, that's not the guy. Yeah. He was a younger guy. And they're like, well, you know, this is Art Venetia, so – yeah. Yeah, and then they show them the picture of Alan. They're like, "Yeah, that's Art Venetia." Right. I mean, it just it yeah, all, it all starts place. crumbling. They bring in, they end up bringing in uh, D, and she ends up giving up right away. They needed a confession still because, like you yep. said, it's just like without full proof. Yeah, they still of couldn't a tie him because these bodies were were practically skeletons. Yeah, now. they dig up the bodies. They they get the wardrobe out. They find the bodies in there. But really, yep. I mean, there's so much. It's hard to get DNA evidence because it's just yep. decayed bodies, skeletons basically. Yep. And uh, but they get a, con- a big confession from D. She's at this point where she's just like, I don't care what happens. She to just me. sells everybody. She out. feels so bad about what happened with Bessie at this point that she's just she feels like trash. Yeah, she feels like she deserves punishment. I she think doesn't have a point. job. She can't provide for her boys or Susan. Susan is basically supporting them. Carrying Susan the load, is living yeah. with them, and her daughter Susan, yeah. by the way, and she's yeah she's supporting the whole family, and she feels like trash. She feels like a failure as a mother. Mm-hmm. You know, and plus she's not able to drink. She's running she, low on booze. I think what it is, she finally wanted to do something good, do the right thing. She's been doing the wrong thing for so long. Yeah. It's like at her own expense, she wanted to do the right thing and she came clean. Mm-hmm. And now they bring in Alan and of course he's telling lie after lie and it's all D's fault. And Same thing with Bill and Mike. They bring in Bill and Mike and they're pointing the fingers at each other. Their yep. stories are hilarious as to how the murders went down because it's like, I was just there to, to fix the trailer and then yeah. all, of a sudden, Bill, all of a sudden Mike's strangling this old lady and I'm like, what Bill, are you doing, Mike? I don't want to be a part of this, but he's bigger so I couldn't stop him. Yeah, like, Bill acts up. like he genuinely was going there to fix a roof. Like, right. come on, Bill. Right. Like, who the fuck believes all that? All I brought was my razor. I don't know how I was going to fix the roof, but... Yeah, seriously. Yeah. What a piece of shit. Yeah, so basically uh, was the, they would be brought to justice in 1986 would be the trial, and the uh, they would end up getting convicted. All four would get convicted of yep. two, two counts of murder. Mm-hmm. And then in 1987 was the sentencing where they would all four receive the death penalty, yeah. believe it or not. All this four. is Florida. This is Florida. D, who wasn't even present at either of the murders, ends up getting dealt the, the death penalty. She was the first woman to ever receive the death penalty in Florida. Yeah. That's crazy. Now, luckily for her, I didn't think she deserved the death penalty, honestly, like for no. her role in this. She definitely was a, a, a big part of why these two murders happened, no doubt. She deserved to get murder yeah. charges. Life in prison, I think, would be the right thing. Mm-hmm. I just feel like the death penalty is reserved for like more severe criminals, people that actually right. literally murder people with their own hands. You know, and she didn't think that was possible either. She didn't think she was getting no. death penalty. She was like, she didn't no think way. she was getting murder. She thought she was getting yeah. like burglary or some shit. I forget yeah, what it her was. Her appointed defense lawyer comes in and he's like, "Yeah, they're going to be seeking the death penalty." And she's like, "What? What? <laughs> like, no way." Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, they they threw the book at her. Yeah, she was convicted and sentenced to death row. However, this sentence was overturned when she got life in prison. Um, a few years later, and I think like 1990, she would end yeah. up getting her over. All four of them would end up getting their death penalties overturned. Right. And they would receive life in prison. Um, D would end up dying of natural causes in 2002 while in prison. Right. I think they saw that D, I don't know about the other three guys, mm-hmm. but they saw that D was more valuable alive, I think. She was, she was a you know, great inmate. She kind of succeeded in what Tookie tried to do. Well, you know, try to reform and try to help other people. 
counsel people. She even helped with like clerical work and stuff yeah. in prison. So she actually proved herself useful alive. And I think that played a big part in her getting a pardon. People loved D. Everybody around her always loved D. Like that's one thing that the book was biased towards her, obviously, oh, yeah, in her very, part in these crimes. She's definitely in guilty of these crimes and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But like people that worked with her always like her, even her children loved her. Um, everyone in prison loved her. They say she was one of the best people they met. You know, she was always willing to help out. Even right. when she had no money, she would offer people that needed money, money. Like, it's the kind of person she was. So that was why I was surprising this story. Like that quote I read in the beginning, you know, many of us, if given the right script and pointed in the right direction with the right influences. Right. Maybe. Could be, you know, accomplices at least to some I mean, crime. Yeah, but I think it, it just got, it got deeper and deeper. At first she thought it was a joke. Right, and then it, she got deeper, and she just kept accepting what was going on and not believing it would actually happen. And then it happened, and then by the time it happened, it was too late to turn back. That's right. You know, so you got to be careful of the company you choose. Don't run into an Arthur Allen, or not not Arthur Allen, but Allen James, yeah, Bryant, and uh, fall for their tricks. Sneaky chameleons of life, man. You got to watch out for chameleon friends. You got to have that skeptical snake look. That's right. Raise an eyebrow. If you don't know what we're talking about, Google skeptical snake. Mm. Snake. <laughs> 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 What'd you say, Ellen? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's it. That's the story. That's the story. That's this the IHOP murder. We hope you guys that didn't take place it. in IHOP. I know. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to name this this episode. If you're listening, you already know. But yeah, these are the kind of things I hate. One of my worst, my least favorite things to do when recording podcasts and stuff is writing the description. I hate doing it. So I've been like, <laughs> making Michael do it lately. Yeah. And like, what's one up more with task? An, and, and naming. <laughs> I know. What's one more thing I can make Michael do? <laughs> Trying to take his, I'm I'm trying to Allen this shit. Right, I'm trying yeah. to make you You're my. You're doing D. a great job. I'm making you my D, bro. Right. I hear you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I still like doing my jobs here. Uh, I know. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what we're gonna name it. The well, puppet, the puppet master, Allen. Why are you talking James about Bryant? it? It's already been named. Yeah, they're already listening to it. I don't know. Let's do some shoutouts. All huh? right, let's do it. All right. First and foremost, the uh, Jameson donor. Right, Cassandra. Cassandra in Ireland. In Ireland. Thanks again. Thanks for the whiskey who uh, helped we, us get through the second part of this episode. It did. We've been enjoying it for Much the appreciated. whole second part. Very smooth. You yeah. Irish, you know how to make whiskey. That's right. Uh, a big shout out to a uh, fellow true crime podcast, Fatal. They sent, uh, we did a sticker swap. They, uh, we sent them some stickers and then they sent over a sticker and a magnet. So definitely check nice. out Fatal. Thanks, Great guys. Great podcast. Uh, so a big shout out to some people that hit us up on Twitter and gave us some good feedback this week. Brad K in Southern Indiana. This shit's hilarious. You probably don't know about this one yet. Uh, Brad K in Southern Indiana was at a local biker bar yeah. hanging out and the jukebox went offline and people started yelling put, to put something on. So he went, he went and put on our Silk Road episode at this biker Dude, bar. Dude, let us know how that went. <laughs> he did. He texted He's like, everybody loved it. They had me, they had me install in Stitcher and, and, and podcast apps on their phones and stuff. So Oh, sweet. Uh, shout out to anybody that heard us at that bar. If you're listening now, let us Hell know. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's, and if you happen to be in a public setting, definitely put on our show. That's cool. Yeah, that as long as there's cool. no kids around. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, also from Twitter, Stuart K in the UK. What's up, Cami in Arizona and Patty over in Ireland, another Ireland listener. What's up, Ireland this week? That's right. Ireland's Showing stepping up big, up big right? That's right. You got some Facebook you, love or what? Yeah, I do. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Keely Smaka for a suggestion that we are going to do next week. Oh, shit. Teaser. Teaser. We're not going to tell you everybody else what it nope. is, but she knows. She knows. Keely so knows. thank you for that awesome suggestion. We're excited about that one. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Kristen Gilbranson for doing some awesome artwork for me, which I'll be posting later. I'm going to get it framed. It's pretty sick. It's it's pretty dope. Yeah. Uh, also, a shout out to Shannon, uh, Shannon Lamb in Kansas for supporting us Who's in that? Riot Fest. Never heard of her. In Riot Fest. Yeah. So, she, I mean, uh, where was she at? In Chicago. She yeah. went to Chicago for Riot Fest and was sporting our T-shirt there, which is pretty dope. Walking around with she our said, faces. She said people were asking when our band goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a folk duo. Right. Yeah. <laughs> One plays the upright bass and kicks a kick drum. One plays a banjo. Right. We got to get on that, dude. I can do a Cookie Monster voice. <laughs> is that is that helpful? No. Oh. That's not even punk. Though. Oh. Right. It was mostly punk bands, right? Yeah, I guess so. I like punk music. Yeah. So uh, Instagram love. Jessica D, Katrina L, Megan M. Jessica S. in Arkansas, Seth Sacramento, and Jenny B., thanks for the love on Instagram this week. I love it when people share the show with their Instagram followers and all that stuff and talk about it or comment, whatever. Um, some iTunes reviews. Thank you, Lovey Dovey 15 She wrote us a great review, and at the end she asked, uh, how do I get your previous podcast? I understand that on iTunes mm-hmm. a lot of our older episodes are missing. Yeah, I, I think it cuts why. it off at Eileen Warnos. 
Yeah, that's no good. There's a bunch before that. And right. if you go, if you download the Podbean app, you should be able to get all of them. If you go follow us on Podbean and you can comment on there, we respond to that stuff too. Or if you go to right. truecrimeguys.com, which takes you to our Podbean page, it has right. every episode that we have posted on there, aside from our Patreon ones, obviously. Exactly. So anybody that, we get that question a lot, like people that use iTunes, they don't see our old ones. So there you go. Yep. Go to Podbean. Use the Podbean app for us if you want the older episodes. Bree D, Black Mamba 697 and Jay Hisako Hamilton, thank you all for your five-star reviews. It's definitely much appreciated. It helps the shows a lot. Uh, thank you to everybody that bought stickers this week. If you want a sticker, a tr- either a classic True Crime Guys Creep Van sticker or a Let's Do Cult Shit sticker or both, yeah. uh, go to our website, truecrimeguys.com, click on stickers, donate a couple bucks. We'll send you some stickers. Right. And a uh, personal note, I sent uh, Brittany Schultz uh, some stickers this week, and on the envelope was pizza grease, and nice. she posted it on Twitter. I, t- I told her... He really just slobbered on it. It's, <laughs> right. it's Lauren DNA. It Congratulations. Great. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so stickers. Thanks uh, for all the new Patreon. All the new Patreon. Donors. Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash True Crime Guys. Yes. There's how many episodes up there? Five, six. You can get them all for two bucks. Five. Yeah. Get them all for two bucks a month right now. That's right. We put a little extra work into those. So yeah. Take a listen to those. I'm trying, I'm trying to get Lauren to uh, let us release one for Christmas, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. They're bigger name ones, too. We typically do the smaller cases on our regular episodes, and then we do the mm-hmm. – we've done Jeffrey Dahmer. We've done uh, – John Gacy. John Gacy. We've done Gary Ridgway, the uh, yep. the great Bambino of serial killers. We've done Slender Man. We did Tookie, which – Tookie was awesome. Tookie was one of our favorites. It's definitely one of my favorite cases. Yeah. So, and then there's also a bunch of bonus stuff on there on patreon.com slash true crime guys. You can get bonus recordings, bonus pictures. I do some, uh, some fancy work with, uh, uh Photoshop. Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> there's all funny. kinds of fun stuff on there for two Lots bucks. Of a inside month. jokes. Yep. Come join us in the petty laughter. Right. Uh, we're on social media everywhere at true crime guys. Uh, yep. if you want to email us true crime guys at gmail.com. Yep. Now I've had some people, you know, send us business things or whatever through Facebook, or whatever. Yeah, just send them to the email because me and Lauren both get the emails and we can both look over them and you yep. know, talk about it, respond back, all that good stuff. Yep, we got merch on Redbubble. If you go to redbubble.com and search yep. True Crime Guys, we've got our own shop on there with all kinds of different designs. You got the Let's Do Cult Shit shirts and. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff on there. There's clocks, phone skins. Yep. And the uh, the winner of the sticker competition sticker is up there. So oh, the guy yeah. getting his brains blown out that says True Crime Guys on the wall. It's pretty yep. dope. So get you one of those. Yep. Relatively cheap. I think they're like two dollars and something or something like that. So yep. It's a good deal. Good quality stuff there. All right. Anything else? No, dude. I'm ready to go. This is a fucking long episode. Yeah, it was way longer <laughs> than we expected, man. We went deep on D's backstory. Was, yeah. It's crazy. We did, but people like the backstories. Right? Backstories are fun, though. Yeah, they are. All right, we done? Can We're we, done. Can we See you next week. Keep creeping. Keep creeping. All sensible people keep things in control.